A very strange anomaly sits in a humanoid containment cell in the minimum security wing of Site-17. He walks, talks, and looks like a man, but everything else is convoluted in a question mark. This is SCP-343, who, like his namesake, God, is likely to cause arguments whenever he's brought up. Is he the creator of all that exists, the basis for the Abrahamic faiths, or is he a pretender? a reality warper with immense power and predilection towards delusion, a courtesan of the House of Maladrog, Matthew, Methuselah, Yahweh, who knows? Really, it depends on who you ask, and which stories you choose to believe, and few people enjoy a good story more than SCP-343 himself. If one day you take the time to visit him in his room and ask him to reveal a page in the long book of his personal history, he might be kind enough to tell you a story. A story like this, of an encounter with something monstrous that few others could hope to survive meeting face to face. Rewind a few thousand years. Nobody knows how many, exactly. God, as he chooses to dub himself, walked across the cracked ground on worn sandals. It'd been some time since he'd seen an animal around here, and even longer since he'd seen a human being. Not that this bothered him. He'd never been bothered by his own company on a long walk like this. Of course, he could have sped up time or teleported, but where was the fun in that? He was a tourist in the world of sensation, of experience, of flesh, bone, dirt, blood, and sand. After all, where's the fun in creating a whole universe if you can't drop in now and then to visit and do as the Romans do? Not that the Romans would be around for another few thousand years. Even Atlas must occasionally shift the weight of the globe from his shoulders for a jaunt around the cosmic neighborhood and whatever passes for fresh air in the vacuum. God whistled a tune to himself. It was a craggy, mountainous region he'd found himself in. The distant peaks had frosted caps, a breathtaking place where many truly had their breaths taken away. How humans will so happily risk their lives to do something extraordinary. It never ceased to amaze him. His stomach rumbled. Oh, how he enjoyed that sensation. One of the funny little quirks of this human form that he weaved for himself. It was no reason to be concerned. If memory served, from his last trip through the area a few decades before, there was a friendly village not far from here. They had always accepted him as a genial stranger, having no knowledge of his true power. God had always believed that a person's goodness is defined by how they treat those from whom they had nothing to gain. So it caused him great concern as he approached the village and saw great plumes of smoke rising into the sky. He was so shocked by this that he could decide to break his rule about walking as a man, in case there was still some way he could help. With a snap of his fingers, he disappeared and reappeared in the center of the village's town square. Total devastation. Huts and houses had been torn asunder. Broken weapons lay on the ground. Some places were on fire, others smeared with streaks of blood, like some terrible battle had occurred here. But something was wrong. No bodies, not one, from defender or assailant. How could a thriving village be so thoroughly destroyed and not leave a single corpse? It was an act so bizarre and depraved that it left even God puzzling. That was another downside of his human form. Here on Earth, he didn't have access to true omniscience. How could a mere human mind, bound by the constraints of linear time, ever truly comprehend the total of existence? Even attempting to do that here would melt the brain of his human body in its skull and leave it dribbling out of his nose and ears. Instead, he chose to walk around the ruins of the village and investigate firsthand. Arrows and broken spears and swords littered the ground. Some buildings were demolished, but there were no tracks or stray projectiles that could suggest the presence of siege weapons. No, these buildings looked like they were ripped apart. Some even still had claw marks. What terrible beast could have set upon this town and done this? Then he heard a voice, quiet and pleading beneath some nearby rubble. A survivor, he rushed over to the pile and evaporated it with a thought. Underneath, a feeble old man, covered in stone dust, was quivering. God helped him up and guided him into one of the few remaining huts still standing in the village. They both took seats. God held up two hands, cradling empty space. Two cups suddenly occupied that space, both filled with warm healing tea. 
He passed the old man one of the cups while sipping from his own. He asked the old man if he'd seen what had happened. The old man told him no, he hadn't seen anything in decades. He'd been rendered blind in his youth. Little did either of them know, that very blindness was the only reason he was the sole survivor of the massacre. The blind man told God that one of the village's scouts had gone up into the mountain with a small hunting party. The group was gone for days, until one of the members, the youngest among them, returned weeping, frostbitten, and covered in blood. He said that his friends had been killed by a beast in the mountains, something that almost looked like a man, but terribly wrong. And its face, its awful, awful face, he would never forget it. He was just lucky to escape with his life when the others were torn apart. But when the young man returned, he'd brought the shadow of death with him. It was a curse that doomed the entire village, men, women, and children, to a terrible fate. And that fate was upon them a mere hour after the survivor had returned. Of course, there were gaps in the blind man's understanding, given he was lacking one of his major senses. But the sounds he could describe with perfect clarity. It was faint and distant at first, that awful wail and the galloping, hands and feet thundering against the ground faster than any horse could move, getting closer and closer. Another villager saw it approaching and screamed. Then it was upon them. The villagers screamed, but it screamed louder, always wailing and shrieking and sobbing like a monster crawling straight up from hell. People tried to fight it by the sounds of it. The blind man with teary blank eyes recalled the sounds of arrows knocking and swords clashing against something. But even their greatest warriors had screamed and died. Those who saw it and tried to flee and hide were slaughtered all the same. Soon enough, there were only two sounds left in the village, the monster and the blind man, both weeping. He didn't understand why it never took him. It wasn't fair. It took everything else. To leave him here alive when everyone and everything he'd ever known was destroyed was a greater punishment than even death. After killing all of these innocents, the monster had simply wandered off to the mountains again, the sound of its quiet sobs getting smaller and smaller until it was gone altogether. God comforted the blind man as he wept for the loss of all his loved ones. He told the blind man that he would venture up to the mountains himself and confront the creature on its own territory, and at the very least, find out why it had done this terrible thing. But first, he must relocate the blind man to a safer place. He placed a hand on the blind man's shoulder and he vanished. He would appear in another friendly village miles away. God sent a silent message into the minds of every villager. Take good care of this man. He has undergone horrors you can't even imagine. Your kindness will be rewarded later. For that, you have my promise. God sighed and turned his tired eyes to the distant mountains. A monster lurked up there, perhaps one of his own creations, or maybe a corruption of one of his creations. Either way, whatever existed without his knowledge existed without his consent and he intended to know of the beast in the mountains. Though given what he'd seen already, he didn't expect to receive a warm welcome from this murderous demon. Miles away up in the mountains, the creature licked the blood from its cracked lips. It looked like it might have once been a human being or something that aspired to humanity or mocked it with its very existence. It was a huge, gangling beast, Skin alablaster, eyes empty and soulless, dribbling rivulets of burning tears down a hideous, gaunt face. It crawled into the frozen mouth of a cave with great icicle fangs, wheezing and weeping. All it ever wanted was to be alone. Why did they have to keep interfering? Didn't they know what happened? All the terrible things they made it do. The creature curled its long, gangly body into the fetal position scratching great ruts into the sides of its bald cranium with long, sharp fingers. Terrible things. Terrible, terrible things. And then there was a brilliant flash just a few feet away. The monster was surprised. It turned to see a figure silhouetted in the mouth of the cave. He wore sandals and thin robes. His eyes glowed with a kind of power that the monster didn't recognize. This stranger stared at the monster without an ounce of fear in his heart. He stared right into its eyes, unwavering. 
No, 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 no. It could feel it again, the rage bubbling up deep down. A cauldron of seething anger, it hated the feeling like being lowered into a vat of molten metal. Unspeakable fire and pain coursing through every vessel. It began to weep and scream while the stranger in the cave mouth just watched, not moving a muscle. Do you know who I am? The stranger asked with a deep voice that betrayed almost infinite power, knowledge, and wisdom. But it wouldn't change the outcome here. The monster bounded at him at speeds that wouldn't be seen again until jet planes and bullet trains are invented millennia into the future. Its jaws were hanging impossibly wide, fangs born, its arms extended and deadly claws ready to strike. But before those terrible hands could close around the stranger, he vanished. The monster stumbled and rolled across the snow, confused. What trickery was being used here? I'll take that as a no, said the voice from behind him. You ought to show your father some respect. More respect than you gave to those poor people down in the village, at least. Seething, the creature turned and saw the stranger standing back in the darkness of the cave, staring at him. But the beast didn't have the capacity for awe or holy terror. Only violence. Boundless, limitless, unstoppable violence. It darted towards the stranger again, trying to strike him. Somehow, it was like fighting in an empty robe. Not a single one of its deadly strikes seemed to hit the stranger. The stranger leaped backwards, putting some space between himself and the monster, but still not breaking a sweat. He breathed in deeply, then exhaled. The breath came out like a mighty typhoon, shocking even the monster with its sudden force. It was blown backwards, a leaf in the wind, until its long claws dug into the ground and anchored it in place. The stranger gave a wry smile at this, impressed. My, my, you're certainly a tenacious one, aren't you? He said. Perhaps we can talk for a little while instead of fighting. I want to know why you killed all those people. No answer. The beast roared, its mighty limbs pounding into the ground as it closed the gap between itself and the stranger in fractions of a second. It would kill him, rend him, destroy him just like all the others. He'd left it no choice. Suddenly, the ground below it seemed to give way. The creature was confused. It looked down to see that the ancient stone below had somehow taken on the properties of a liquid, and it was sinking. The beast panicked and it began to thrash. It was a strong swimmer, but it didn't expect to need to swim here. The shock was too much, and soon the ground submerged it entirely muffling its terrible roars and shrieks. And just like that, the ground was solid again, trapping the beast inside. The stranger stepped forward and looked at the ground. A much needed time out, he said. You do yourself no good struggling like this. Despite its terrible capacity for evil, God couldn't help but admire the beast, at least on the level of construction. It was so pared down, so unburdened, a killer to the core, but seemingly unkillable. Had he made this creature? Billions of species, and the species those in turn had created through billions of years of breeding and evolution. And somewhere along the line, this thing happened. It was easy even for the universe's creator to lose track of some of the tinier variables. And in the grand scheme of things, even this monster was still a tiny variable. But right here, right now, it was still one hell of a problem. The ground rumbled below God. Cracks formed. The mountain peak shook. God raised an eyebrow, genuinely impressed, as the monster ripped free of its stone prison and re-entered the fray. It roared and screamed still, its blank eyes fixed on him. Its skeletal body throbbed and heaved with power. Unlike any other creature in nature, it was almost like the longer their conflict went on, the more energized the beast became. God sighed. All those poor villagers. They never stood a chance against this monster. It lunged for him, even faster and stronger than before. He teleported out of the way in the nick of time, and the beast's claws cleaved through a nearby cave wall, effortless. God materialized nearby, but he didn't have time to speak. The beast lunged again and again and again. Every time he reappeared, the beast went for him with impossible speed. Deciding to widen the playing field, God teleported to the top of the mountain. The creature, somehow sensing his presence, vaulted upwards and tunneled through the roof of the cave. 
bursting out of the ground in front of God, who was floating just slightly off the ground. It would be wise of you to stop. God carefully intoned. All this time, you know, I've been going easy on you. You don't want to find out what the wrath of God looks like. Storm clouds were gathering above. Mighty thunder roared across the sky. The beast was undeterred. It roared and galloped towards God, and God in turn called down a response. A volley of lightning the likes of which the world has never seen before or since struck down on the charging monster. The sudden white flash could sting the eyes from miles away. The monster shrieked from the blast, feeling its flesh lift off its bones and atomize in the sheer heat of the electricity around it. It could smell itself cooking. The lightning blast only lasted for a few seconds, but for the beast, it felt like eternity. When the onslaught stopped, the air was still heavy with electrical potential. God stared down at the black scorch mark on the side of the mountain where the creature had been standing. All the snow within a mile had been evaporated by the blast. It was a raw display of the power of nature that would make even Zeus tremble in his sandals. And yet, there was still movement. Something started to get up from the burnt patch where nothing should be left alive. A blackened skeleton, rising shakily from the ash but still very much alive. As it started to rise, new flesh began growing over its bones little by little. Even God was astonished by the sight of it. He'd never seen a creature cling so ardently to life in spite of having truly unsurmountable power amassed against it. It was up against God, and still, it fought. The monster tottered on its freakishly long limbs, still disoriented, unusually staggered for a creature driven by such single-minded violent purpose. When enough of its face grew back to do so, it began to weep and sob again, tears streaking down its terrible face. Looking at this creature after all of this, God couldn't help but feel a new emotion, pity. He lowered himself to the ground and approached the creature, like none had ever done before. He gathered it up into his arms and he held it, feeling its heaving, wretched sobs against him. The beast was in so much pain, he could feel it radiating from within. Speak, my son, God said in a soft, fatherly voice. And for the first and only time, the monster spoke. Can look, can see, <coughs> make me a people, known wonder people. Can look, can look, please. That was all it managed to choke out before devolving back into unintelligible babble. But it was enough. Enough for God to understand its pain. He did not know if it would be right to change the monster's nature. Is it ever right to truly change anyone's nature? But it was within his almost limitless power to grant it one reprieve from pain. He settled the beast in the snow below him. It was quiet and still. And God said unto the beast, Rest now, child. Rest for thousands of years if you must. I hope only that when you eventually awaken, you feel differently. And so another story from the catalog of SCP-343. Of course, it leaves us with certain questions, mm. chief among them being, is it true? Did 343 and 096 have this chance encounter long ago? Or is this just another tall tale from an anomaly who fancies himself a deity? We have our truth and you have yours. Let us know what you believe down below in the comments. A month ago, Dr. Robert Maxwell was a senior researcher working at the facility, but a tragic mistake had cost the lives of several of his co-researchers. Now he was being led down a bleak hallway in armed biocontainment area 14, a rifle-wielding guard flanking him on either side. The once rising researcher had a very different title now, D-8724. He had been made a D-class personnel, a death sentence. However, as the guards led him to his possible demise, he wasn't dressed in the typical D-class orange jumpsuit. No, he was dressed in frilly Rococo dining wear more typical of 18th century France. If anything, Dr. Maxwell looked like he was on his way to meet royalty, and in a sense, he was. The former researcher had begged for any other assignment, but the site director insisted on committing Dr. Maxwell to tea time with SCP-082. 
He'd always been the talkative type, so the two would make a perfect pairing. And if the creature found him sufficiently amusing, then Maxwell might even leave the containment cell alive. He had heard legends of the giant creature they called the cannibal. Maxwell hoped they were just stories. Dr. Maxwell was pushed by the guards into a large, luxuriously appointed room, and the doors were locked behind him. He felt like a child, surrounded by freakishly large furniture and ten-foot-high ceilings. The fog of obnoxious floral perfumes couldn't fully cover up the pervasive smell of death that lingered in the cavernous halls of 082's palace. Thanks to an elaborate ruse conducted by the Foundation, SCP-082 believed he was the King of France, and that his containment cell was a palace where he remained for his own safety. The creature's continued good behavior and everyone else's safety relied on visitors keeping up that lie. Maxwell had never worked in this area of the facility, so a lot of the standard procedures were new to him. Still, his superior had given him a clear directive. Talk to the monster, communicate with him, be cordial and friendly. See if you can find out more about his mysterious past. And most importantly, if you want to survive, don't annoy him. The down-on-his-luck scientist gulped inside, trying to steady his nerves in this oversized, fake French palace. He just kept thinking, surely he can't be that big. He almost talked himself into believing that the accounts of the creature were just that, tall tales, until a huge figure began lumbering into the main chamber. It was him, SCP-082, also known as Fernand the Cannibal. SCP-082 was an eight-foot-tall hulking monster built sturdier than the castles it likes to imagine are its true home. Swollen, bloated, and grossly out of proportion, the creature clocks in at over 700 pounds, most of which is pure muscle that's almost impossible to pierce with conventional weaponry. SCP-082 stopped just feet away and stared at Dr. Maxwell with its beady, sunken in eyes like a hungry rat. Just the sight of it struck terror into Dr. Maxwell's heart, but he didn't dare show his fear. Instead, he remembered his brief training, bowing politely and forcing a smile, referring to the creature as Your Highness, and profusely thanking it for granting him an audience. The monster continued staring without saying anything, and then gave a wide, lock-jawed grin, showing off its huge teeth. It did everything through gritted teeth, except eat and sing. Dr. Maxwell hoped he wouldn't be a part of either activity. Fernand gave a low, booming chuckle. He thanked Dr. Maxwell for coming to give him some company and invited him to come further inside and take a seat, adding, with a sly wink, that he won't bite. The monster complained that he so rarely gets visitors to the palace these days, but he omitted the fact that the main reason for this was his tendency to devour them. Maxwell nodded and followed the giant deeper into its oversized abode. He couldn't help but notice that the monster's arms looked like huge, fleshy punching bags. He knew that if Fernand wanted to, he could easily crush him flat, just like he'd done to so many unfortunate guards during containment breaches. Fernand told Dr. Maxwell that he was thinking of having some decorating work done. The walls of his palace were starting to look awfully drab, and he gestured to one covered with a rusty red streak. Maxwell remembered that D-Class cleaners were sent into the containment cell twice a month to tidy any of Ferdinand's messes, but they often ended up becoming one of the messes themselves. The creature encouraged Maxwell to take a seat at his oversized dining table, while he tended to a pot of what he said was full of delicious onion soup. Maxwell obliged his host's request and took a seat at a huge chair that made him look like a six-year-old sitting at the grown-up's table. Meanwhile, Ferdinand was using a huge machete-like knife to cleave onions in half for his bubbling pot of stew. Even though Ferdinand had shown no signs of outward aggression, as he watched the cannibal hack away at onions with his enormous knife, Maxwell could feel himself beginning to sweat. After all, they didn't call this creature the cannibal for nothing. This was a monster with a truly horrifying body count. During previous containment breaches, it had taken enough tranquilizer to put down two elephants to subdue the creature, but not before multiple agents quite literally lost their heads in the process. Fernand was able to bite them off with one huge chomp like he was eating a drumstick, snapping right through the bone with his incredible tooth and jaw strength. 
Surprisingly, when he wasn't on a violent rampage, Foundation researchers had found SCP-082 to be unusually polite and forthcoming, offering the researchers plenty of information about himself and his past. The only problem was that almost everything the creature said was a complete lie. From his time as a researcher, Maxwell knew that there were only a few details about the creature that could be ascertained for certain. SCP-082 would reliably answer to the name Fernand, and genetically, Ferdinand was technically human. The means by which Ferdinand became so grotesquely huge, strong, and cannibalistic are still unknown. Foundation personnel are still looking into whether it's due to some kind of anomalous genetic mutation or by more supernatural means. All we know is that he's big, unpredictable, and extremely dangerous. Dr. Robert Maxwell sat terrified at the dining table of SCP-082 listening to Fernand's slightly dull blade chop through the final onion, which he then tossed into the boiling soup. Fernand had switched the topic of conversation to one of his favorite fictional characters, Hannibal Lecter. Of course, Hannibal the Cannibal isn't quite so fictional to Fernand. While he's been shown to be extremely intelligent in terms of puzzle solving and memory, he seems to have no understanding of the distinctions between fiction and reality. He assumes all movies and TV shows are a form of documentary or reality television. And ever since seeing The Silence of the Lambs, Ferdinand has been eager to meet with Dr. Lecter, which he emphasized to Maxwell over and over. Since trying to explain the concept of fiction to Ferdinand had never previously worked, Maxwell simply told him that Dr. Lecter is extremely busy at the moment, but will visit whenever he gets a chance. This seemed to satisfy Ferdinand, who placed two large bowls of steaming soup on the table before sitting down a little too close to Maxwell. He couldn't help but notice that the giant cannibal was now sitting within biting distance, and as a lowly D-class, nobody would be rushing in to save him if things went south. Ferdinand began ranting through his clenched teeth once more, occasionally stopping to consume a hefty spoonful of onion soup. Maxwell was sure to do the same, not wanting to seem anything less than polite. But soon, the tenor of Ferdinand's rant began to shift. Typically, the monster spoke French or heavily accented English. Now, he was affecting the accent of a Victorian gentleman, peppering his speech with tally-ho and the game is afoot. Maxwell was confused at first, but quickly realized the game Ferdinand was playing. It's well known that Ferdinand is a pathological liar who likes to play numerous characters, changing his mannerisms and clothes accordingly. These personas have included a vampire, Big Bird, Andre the Giant, Foundation researcher Dr. Bright, the Incredible Hulk, Alexander the Great, Captain Hook, Dr. Frankenstein, and Frankenstein's monster. And, of course, in this case, the iconic fictional detective, Sherlock Holmes. Fearing for his life in this strange situation, Dr. Maxwell did the only thing he could, play along. As Fernand reeled off his Holmesian delusions, Maxwell began to play the role of Dr. John Watson, asking follow-up questions and complimenting Ferdinand's impeccable deductive reasoning. And it seemed to be working. Ferdinand played along too, acting as though the two of them really were Arthur Conan Doyle's crime-fighting duo. Towards the end of their game, Dr. Maxwell was even starting to enjoy it, amazed that his quick thinking was actually keeping him safe. But just then, the cannibal froze, as if in a trance. He locked eyes with Dr. Maxwell, like a mad dog that you can't tell if it's going to bite you or not. He saw the creature's gargantuan teeth separating, its huge jaws stretching open. This could surely only mean one thing. Dr. Maxwell winced and prepared for death, cursing that all of his quick thinking had amounted to nothing. Fernand leaned towards him, his gaping maw with its hot onion-scented breath just inches away from Maxwell. And then, he began to sing. The cannibal broke into a raucous Victorian pub song, happy and jovial. In his moment of terror, Dr. Maxwell had forgotten that this was the other reason SCP-082 opens his nightmarish jaws. Relief washed over him as he knew he was safe, at least for the moment. Not long after, Foundation guards arrived and escorted him from the cell, leaving the delusional giant to his own devices back in the so-called palace. The former researcher had done it. He had bested Ferdinand the Cannibal, and hopefully it would be the last time he'd ever be face to face with that deranged giant. 
Unfortunately for Dr. Robert Maxwell, in a performance review later that week, one of his superiors remarked that Ferdinand enjoyed his company and he had done a great job. Such a good job, in fact, that Ferdinand insisted he have Dr. Maxwell for dinner, or any other meal, for that matter, sometime very soon. SCP-1730 is one of the biggest threats the Foundation has ever faced. SCP-1730 does not exist. It was June 5th when the compound was first discovered, a large complex of structures in rural Texas about 15 kilometers northwest of the Mexican border, located in Big Bend Ranch State Park. It was easily the biggest structure in the area, but there was no record of any uh -huh. such structure ever being built. A massive network of power stations, containment facilities, and research buildings, SCP-1730 looked like it had been abandoned for a long time. The exterior was degraded, but the building was still operating. A power generator had been running for an indeterminate amount of time. Even as the infrastructure degraded, power flickered through the site and fuel leaked frequently, but there was one detail that attracted the attention of SCP brass. SCP-1730 bore identifying markings linking it to Foundation Site 13, a research facility that was marked for construction near Nome, Alaska. But Site 13 had never been built, having been abandoned in the planning stages. So why is it in the middle of Texas, fully constructed and long abandoned? The Foundation needed to know more, and they needed their best to investigate. It was time to call in the Game Wardens. Apollo 3, the mobile task force used to investigate dangerous sites, was brought in, and five elite agents were briefed and sent in – Ross, Houston, Noah, Ohalo, and Vigo. It didn't take long for them to discover that something was very wrong with the site of SCP-1730. The facility was located in the middle of South Texas, but the local flora surrounding it was native to Nome, Alaska. Something had transported a building that shouldn't exist to another place and time. Commander Ross ordered his men to enter, with Houston taking the lead. They discovered that the entry led down a long staircase. They descended slowly, following a strange light that no one could identify, but had a sudden shock when they discovered that the basement of the staircase was missing. The light suddenly stopped, and it became so dark that it was impossible to see what lay beyond the staircase. Upon probing the inky black void at the base of the staircase, they determined it wasn't a fog or shadow. It was a liquid, and it was rising. Ross ordered the men to pull back, but Houston was in too deep. He couldn't break free from the inky black liquid. The men pulled him away and got him free, but his legs were gone. Not ripped off because there was no blood anywhere, smoothly cut off, as if they were never there. And as they put Houston down, he stood up on phantom legs. He didn't feel any pain, but everyone could tell something was very wrong with this place. And the messages they started seeing on the wall made clear they weren't the only ones who knew it. What happened to Site 13? Death here. Not my body. Bleed. There had been other people or things inside SCP-1730, and they wanted anyone who entered to know that this was a very dangerous place to be. As they advanced down the hall back toward the entrance, they saw what looked like a person in the distance, but as they approached it became clear it wasn't another explorer, it was an old, horribly disfigured corpse seemingly attached to the wall, not by chains, but fused to the wall in unnatural ways. At first the team seemed unconcerned, recognizing the corpse as someone named Zachary. Fortunately, command back at the base realized this as the effects of some sort of cognito hazard, a mental infection in the base. They uploaded a filter to their helmets and the team recoiled in horror at the sight in front of them. But the horrors were just beginning. They turned around to see a shimmering humanoid entity in the hallway behind them. As it approached, its footsteps distorted the hallway around. It pulled AP-3 Noah toward it without touching him. And as the soldier was pulled into its clutches, his body started to distort. Vigo was next, being grabbed by the arm by a long appendage, and his arm started to change color and distort. But the Foundation sent Apollo 3 and prepared. Houston produced a portable reality anchor, designed to handle reality warping entities, and with a flash of red light the creature was revealed. It was a horribly elongated humanoid that only existed for a second before the reality anchor erased it and restored the hallway to its normal state. Vigo would recover, with the strange red color in his arm fading eventually. Noah wasn't so lucky. He was already dead, and had been fused into the wall just like the unfortunate corpse. These horrors had been encountered just by trying to return to the entrance, so it was clear the only smart thing to do was to descend further into the facilities and get some answers. As they advanced, not encountering any other supernatural entities, they saw more evidence of the dark things that had occurred in Site-13. 
The infirmary had been torn apart, a cafeteria had been melted into slag, and a large group of containment cells ended with a section called Olympia class. But while most of the other cells were standard sized, these were over 100 meters high. What had the foundation, or whoever ran this place, been keeping in these cells? They would get more answers as they made their way down the hall, where they saw a single television still working and illuminating the hallway. At first the television flickered, but the image soon cleared and the agents were able to see what it was broadcasting. It was the interior of a containment cell, and there was someone in it, and they recognized them as one of the most dangerous beings contained by the SCP Foundation, Bobble the Clown. A predatory supernatural clown that inhabits a children's TV show, Bobble the Clown was broadcast by an unknown source and could only be seen by children under 10. Originally seeming to be a normal kid show about a clown, every episode eventually devolved into the murderous Bobble teaching kids how to do horrible things like arson and torture. The Foundation eventually captured and isolated Bobble's broadcast, but the clown remained hostile and vicious. But not here. As the team talked to the Bobble trapped in the mysterious site 13, it became clear that this clown was broken by whatever it had experienced. It rambled, it hid from the camera, and it was clearly terrified as it told the team about the horrors of the site, and it seemed to recognize the agents as something familiar, but not completely familiar. It claimed to be able to smell them, and it said they smelled different. As Bobble rambled on, the agents learned about a man named Emerson, who ran the site. Like the Foundation, he was obsessed with containing the strange and dangerous entities in the world, but unlike the Foundation, he didn't just want to protect the world from them. He hated them. The entities in Site 13 didn't even have numbers. Emerson wanted to use them up however he wanted and to dispose of them, and something Bobble called the Meat Grinder. Entities that outlived their usefulness were taken down below and none were ever heard from again. It was directly counter to every SCP Foundation policy, but this site had clearly been performing these horrible experiments for years. How? And why hadn't anyone heard of it? The team continued to make their way into the facility, but their signals were lost as they entered the cryogenics unit. By the time contact had been restored, they were no longer alone. There were survivors, both agents of the Foundation and survivors of the facility, and they were angry. With no way out and massively outnumbered, they called for backup. Mobile Task Force T5, also known as Samsara, was reserved for the heavy-duty missions. They're an elite group of practically immortal cyborgs fashioned from the flesh of a god and equipped with further cybernetic enhancements to eliminate Keter-level threats and to protect themselves from cognito hazards. They were sent in through a drainage gate to look for survivors and neutralize whatever lay within. They didn't know what to expect, but they knew one thing. No one who had been sent in had come out. It wasn't long before they realized how dangerous this mission would be. As they came across some large gated drainage pipes, they could see at least 20 charred bodies of humanoids pushed up against the gate, some reaching their hands through. Whatever had happened in Site 13, these unfortunate beings had been desperate to escape. As they made their way down the drainage pipe, they could feel it getting hotter, as if they were nearing an energy source. And there was one other odd thing about the pipe. It was draining inward, not out. They made their way into a control room where many of the consoles had been destroyed. Looking through a window, their view was obscured by a mysterious black mass. On the control panels, they could read terms like incinerator and body pit access. They split up trying to find answers, but found many of their accesses blocked by the black mass. As the T5 task force argued over their next move, they were startled by a sudden jolt. The giant mass had started moving. The team watched as the mass spun, revealing a giant turbine, which turned the inky substance into a fine slurry that was then scorched by giant streaks of fire. One of the T5 shot open the glass chamber, allowing the team to get closer and blasting them with a wave of heat. As they descended into the chamber, they could see a massive plant-like structure overhead, which started to shake. Suddenly, thousands of glowing pods were released from the massive plant, and each one lit up and let the team view the chamber more clearly. But it was what was inside the pods that was more disturbing. Each pod had a humanoid shape inside, seemingly reaching toward the team until they hit the slurry below and the shadows went dark. The team descended to investigate the slurry when something started to leak out of the walls. Looking at it, they could see something moving within. One of the team members picked up the wriggling object out of the black liquid and it took a bite of his hand. It was a leech and there were thousands more of them moving toward the slurry consuming it. And as the leeches ate, they started growing. They seemed to be moving in unison, communicating with a larger being lurking at the base of the slurry. A larger leech, a queen, or something else. 
the team wasn't sticking around to find out. They beat a hurried escape from the leech room, finding themselves in another hallway. Whatever the black substance was, the entities who had been here had used it, scrawling blood on the walls over and over again. Occasionally, they would come across a drained corpse covered in the black fluid. Had the leeches bled them dry? The facility was so sprawling that the team knew if they wanted any chance of navigating it safely, they needed to get the lay of the land. They needed to find the control center. The door read stairs to cryonics, and the leeches were nowhere to be found. It seemed like a safe path. But as soon as the team entered, the temperature dropped drastically to well below where it would be safe for a human to survive. The team's internal heating system kicked in to save their lives, but it wasn't the only threat. The team was about to encounter exactly what Site 13 was keeping locked up. As soon as they entered the room, sound ceased to work. The filters in their gear were overloaded, and the team saw warnings around the room. Silence. Don't look. A massive, multi-limbed figure emerged, with each of its 60 arms moving independently. The creature had no head, but a large circular structure covered with ancient glowing symbols. Whatever it was, it was ancient, all-powerful, and deadly. The team scrambled to get away as the glyphs on the creature burned white hot. Anyone who touched it was burned. Anyone who looked too long at it felt their optical implants burn out. The symbols on the creature were indecipherable, but one word was clear and printed in English. Emerson. Site 13 was from another world, another timeline where the SCP Foundation evolved into something horrible. Ruled over by Elliot Emerson, it tortured and captured its beings and eventually killed most of them in the horrors of the incinerators. When an escape threatened to destroy the facility, Emerson successfully activated the device that removed the facility from their world into ours. Of course, as any avid follower of the SCP Foundation will know, there's far more to the story than this. Emerson may have been the start of Site-13's problems, but he was far from the end. It's the mission of the century, a daring rescue into the depths of one of the most dangerous locations in the multiverse, Site-13, otherwise known as SCP-1730. When the impossible Site-13 was first discovered, multiple mobile task forces were sent to plummet's depths, and none returned. They were greeted to a labyrinthine nightmare, littered with deadly cognito hazards, escaped SCPs, and mysterious, murderous leeches. Some were trapped along with the civilians they were sent to rescue. Others were killed or changed in unimaginable ways. Mobile Task Force Apollo 3, also known as the Game Wardens, had been sent in on a rescue mission when they encountered a horrifying sight, the captured broadcast of Bobble the Clown, a dangerous SCP known for corrupting and destroying children through its deadly messages. But this bobble was different. Much like everything from Site-13, this bobble came from an entirely different dimension, and he had terrifying information to relay. In the universe where Site-13 originated, the site's psychopathic director, one Elliot Emerson, had struck a deal with the Global Occult Coalition, a controversial government group who intends to protect humanity by killing anomalies rather than containing them. Emerson had converted his site into an unethical, unrestrained slaughterhouse and was incinerating SCPs by the hundred in a so-called body pit. But Emerson's game of death came back and bit him, snapping the threads of reality and turning the entire site into a dimensionally displaced super anomaly. The game wardens realized they were in way over their heads. Their chances of surviving this place were dropping by the second, and if they wanted any chance of succeeding in their mission, they needed backup. So Site Command called in MTF Tau-5, aka Samsara. Calling in Samsara for a run-of-the-mill collection mission is like using a bazooka to kill a housefly. But for a case as severe as 1730, their skills were not only nice to have, but vital. Samsara are among the best of the best, immortal cybernetic clones forged from the flesh of a god, equipped with weaponry and technology that could surpass even that of other elite mobile task force units. The four members of Samsara are so adept at what they do, they earned the nickname named Power Rangers among their peers. The remaining game wardens knew that with Samsara on the case, they may actually survive this thing after all, and they just needed to hold out. Samsara arrived on site not long after, packing some serious technological heat, including arm-mounted incendiary cannons, shock-absorbing leg extensions, heat-resistant plating, and built-in scramble adaptations within their eyes to ward off the deadly cognito hazards. Everyone involved was in for the fight of their lives. The four Samsara agents, Iran Nanku, Munru, and Onru entered via a drainage gate in one of the office buildings above ground and began their descent inside. After observing numerous charred bodies, they deduced that there must have been a massive incinerator somewhere on site. Emerson's incinerator, theorizing that this was connected to the body pit they kept hearing about, they descended further, feeling the temperature rise as they did so. Due to the anomalous nature of 1730, nothing inside made any kind of logical sense. 
caused by a reality warping machine known as Thresher. The internal geography of Site 13 was subject to constant shifts. The team then split up to cover more ground. Munro and Nanku continued to follow the pipes and the heat toward the furnace, while Irantu and Onru broke away to explore what lay beyond a weak wall. After busting through the wall, Irantu and Onru explored several empty office blocks before finding their way into a control room with a glass observation deck. While the window was obscured by garbage and human corpses, signage indicated that the incinerator and the body pit were directly below them. The team once again reconvened and managed to activate the incinerator which shredded the mass stuck inside with several large turbines before burning the resulting slurry, the same process that had happened to so many anomalies under Emerson's watch. With the path cleared, Samsara decided to descend via the incinerator, using the drainage pipe as a kind of makeshift tunnel. Eventually, they happened upon the leeches, large, black, and hungry. These creatures seemed to infest 1730 by the thousand. Anywhere that blood or drainage runoff could be found, the leeches could be found too. They didn't appear to have any connection to an anomaly previously secured and contained by the Foundation. They squeezed and wriggled through the cracks in the walls, searching for fresh blood. Onru detected that the leeches all moved with a kind of collective purpose, suggesting a telepathic hive mind. Onru was able to tap into this hive mind using her cybernetic enhancements and map the chaotic geography of 1730 through the leech colony's collective knowledge. With this new advantage, they could add a second goal to this rescue mission, find the Thresher device causing all the instability and potentially reduce power to it if possible, but they were on the clock to save the other survivors as those leeches were sure to get hungry for warm blood soon. They followed the leeches down the most direct path toward the survivors. On the way, they encountered a horrifying creature, the many-limbed humanoid nightmare that functions as Emerson's eternal punishment, his charred body tied screaming and alive to the platform where the monster's head should be. They managed to make it past the monster before finally rendezvousing with Captain Hollis of Mobile Task Force Zeta-9, otherwise known as the Mole Rats, as well as the Game Wardens and the other survivors. There were 27 surviving members of Site-13 staff, many of which had severe injuries, making it even harder to transport them back to safety through the hazardous terrain. And to make matters worse, the leeches were back. The team quickly decided that the best route out of here was directly past the Thresher, where they could reduce power to the machine for just long enough to create a stable path of escape. Nanku opened fire on a horde of approaching leeches with a flamethrower, and everyone began running for their lives. It was a final make-or-break dash to safety. However, their advance was soon stopped by a strange robed creature drawing a cognito hazardous meme on the wall with its claws. When the team attempted to engage, it attacked, exposing additional deadly memes and the dangerous effects of its single white eye. And we're not talking about internet memes here. These are symbols and information that are often deadly to even bear witness to, and for you or I, this would be a real threat, but not to a team equipped with goggles containing cognito hazard filter technology. The battle was cut short when the floor collapsed underneath them and the creature was devoured by something even larger and more monstrous, a gigantic black leech covered in huge red eyes. Its entrance caused thousands of leeches to spill out into the hall as the monster screeched and slithered its tentacles after them. Allow us to introduce you to Elijah, also known as the Leech Boy, and a pivotal component of the very existence of SCP-1730. He was a boy with the mind of a toddler, but he had the strange ability to absorb blood through people's skin, hence his nickname, Leech Boy. One of the doctors in Site-13, Dr. Hadley, took pity on Elijah. After all, he didn't choose to be the way he was. Director Emerson didn't share Hadley's sympathy. His orders to exterminate all anomalies included humanoids like Elijah. When Hadley protested, Emerson had her beaten within an inch of her life while other dissenters were shot. Dr. Hadley, disgusted by the inhumanity of her superiors, devised the perfect revenge. She sabotaged the incinerator and the body pit, allowing a mass containment breach that flooded the site with deadly anomalies. Young Elijah ended up consuming the slurry of the other shredded anomalies, causing him to mutate into a powerful monster, a behemoth of a leech who gave birth to and controlled all the others. It was Hadley's revenge that caused Emerson to panic and activate Thresher, leading to a rift in reality and the creation of 1730, and by extension, all the problems faced by our heroes today. Samsara and the others fled Leech Boy and began taking a different escape route. However, while en route, they encountered the dreaded Crystal Butterflies, a dangerous SCP capable of destroying organic matter with a mere touch. Irantu stepped up to bat, roasting the creatures with his arm-mounted incinerator and taking extreme damage to his body in the process. But they didn't have time to rest. With the butterflies disposed of, they kept moving, heading toward the Thresher. But not all the SCPs were necessarily working against them. Bobble 
scramble the clown came in handy at the next checkpoint, manifesting in the monitor of an electronic door and opening the way through. As they continued on their journey, they had to fight off frequent attacks from leeches, losing some of the task force members in the process. They were also forced to face off against a number of other anomalies in order to survive, such as SCP-2316 manifesting as floating bodies beneath them, and SCP-1370, which used a huge mechanized body to attack the team of survivors. That was all just a warm-up for the true final battle, though. The floor shattered beneath them, and out of an impossibly huge chamber the monster that had once been Elijah wriggled free, reaching for them with huge tentacles and shrieking from its thousand-toothed maw. It was at least 200 meters tall and barely reacted to any amount of firepower. It seemed like they were all doomed until Captain Hollis had a truly crazy idea. With the help of Samsara, she led the bloodthirsty abomination down through the cryonic center and into an Olympia-class testing chamber. There, as the leech boy was bearing down on them, Hollis opened the gates to two adjacent containment cells, and something beyond incredible happened. Two of the most powerful SCPs ever known, a giant sword-wielding gate guardian and the reality-bending cosmic deer, SCP-2845, entered the arena. What followed was one of the most epic showdowns in the history of the SCP Foundation, as the deer and the gate guardian went to battle against the all-devouring leech. While the monsters fought, Hollis ordered her team to get the rest of the survivors to safety. She and Munro of the Samsara team remained behind to prevent any of the anomalies from escaping as the entire base began sinking into the ground from the combined forces of the battle raging around them and the Thrashers continued onslaught on reality. Even if the survivors escaped, would the anomalous developments inside Site-13 escape and wreak havoc on the world at large? That's when Hollis received a vision, a horrific, charred, post-apocalyptic world roamed by inconceivable powerful entities and nightmare gods. It was a vision so horrific that just seeing it nearly broke her mind. She knew what she had to do, the only way she could truly defeat this terrible place and ensure safety for mankind. While Leech Boy, the Gate Guardian, and the Deer continued their battle for the ages, Hollis ran to Thresher and forced the machine into overdrive. Up above, the remaining members of Samsara, the Mole Rats, and the Game Wardens escorted the survivors to safety. Downstairs, Thresher emitted a blinding white light as the system began overload. In her final moments, all Hollis could do was laugh. Perhaps it was a laugh of pure insanity, of a mind broken by the horror she witnessed. Or perhaps it was a laugh of victory, knowing that in spite of the immense powers all around her, she had won the day. She had saved not only the survivors and her teammates, but possibly all of humanity. And all it cost her was everything. Outside, the survivors had reached a safe distance away when the entirety of Site-13 imploded in a final brilliant flash. When the dust cleared, SCP-1730 was gone. All that was left was an immense crater where the impossible base should have once been. Captain Hollis had done it. Through overloading the Thresher machine, she'd taken this anomaly out of the world the exact same way it had entered. It was torn from its moorings on our Earth and kicked in the infinity of space-time, perhaps never to be seen again, along with everything it contained. SCP-1730 was reclassified to neutralized. Of course, the Foundation would have plenty of other anomalies to pursue soon after, but the nightmare of Emerson Site-13 was over once and for all. A light shines above a metal table with a chair positioned on either side. This is the isolated, hermetically sealed interview chamber of Provisional Site-23. Outside the room waits two shell-shocked human mobile task force members, another with invisible ghost legs, three powerful cyborgs, and a scientist from another dimension. They're all here to talk about one thing, the nightmare that unfolded at Site-13 also known as SCP-1730. Everyone thinks they know the story. A mysterious site suddenly appears in Texas, seeming to exactly match the blueprint for an abandoned site that's supposed to be in Nome, Alaska. What started as a simple anomalous location turned out to be an epic horror from another dimension. The task forces sent in by the Foundation were either massacred or trapped inside, and those who survived reported seeing unspeakable carnage inside the base, including a death machine designed to destroy anomalies. And that's not all. As a result of the mysterious Thresher machine, the entire location had been transformed into a shifting spatial anomaly filled with creatures straight out of a nightmare, from giant telepathic leech monsters to huge multi-limbed demigods that would eternally punish the site's murderous director, Elliot Emerson. It was only through the combined might of three different mobile task forces, including the legendary Samsara and the sacrifice of brave Captain Hollis, that the cursed location was finally flung into a different dimension, neutralizing the threat it posed to our reality. But for the SCP Foundation, the story doesn't end with neutralization. There's still plenty more questions that need answering, and that's why 
Today, we're going to tell you what they found out after the neutralization of SCP-1730. Not only will we discover what's become of the many people involved, we'll learn about what happened in the last moments before the neutralization took place. And perhaps most importantly of all, for the sake of our universe, we'll find out how Site-13 came into existence and how Site Director Emerson went down such a dark path. It's time to get some answers. Welcome to the final part of the SCP-1730 saga as we close the book on one of the most deadly locations in the Foundation multiverse. First to sit down in the interview chair was Captain Ephraim Ross, leader of the Mobile Task Force Apollo 3, also known as the Game Wardens. He was a shaken man, looking far older than his 35 years, his eyes heavy with the weight of the horrors he'd seen. And he and his team were among the first to venture into the bowels of Site-13 and witness the atrocities that had gone down there, like the body pit full of fleshy slurry or the countless containment chambers that marked their occupants for vivisection and termination. Captain Ross was haunted by the things that happened to his team under his watch as the anomalous transformation of Houston's legs and the nightmarish warping death of Noah at the hands of a stretchy, reality-bending anomaly. He compared the state of chaos going on down there to something like Jurassic Park, where all hell had broken loose and the monsters ruled. He also remarked on the Olympia containment cells, each the size of a football stadium, capable of containing things far beyond the scope of this universe's SCP Foundation. His interviewer was the hard-nosed Dr. Peter Vincent, who thanked Captain Ross for his contributions and called in the next interview subject. Agent Liam Mahalo, a Game Warden's task force member working under Captain Ross. He had a thousand-yard stare, and even the untrained observer could see that Agent Mahalo had left some parts of himself back in Site-13. When Dr. Vincent attempted to interview him, he mostly remained silent, only volunteering one grim statement. We should have died in there. This isn't real. This isn't real. We were supposed to die in there. Next to be interviewed was Captain Irantu of Mobile Task Force Tau-5, aka Samsara. His interviewer, Dr. Isha St. Clair, questioned him about the nature of the mission, and the cybernetic soldier was even keeled about the matter. He said that in spite of regrettable losses of life, he was still satisfied with the outcome of the mission overall. The high-value targets were rescued, the anomaly was for all intents and purposes neutralized, and the degree of loss was actually better than their pre-mission predictions. It seems that the weight of death doesn't weigh quite as heavily on those who will probably never have to experience it, as the Samsara team are capable of simply being rebooted into new bodies if terminated in the field. People like Captain Hollis weren't as lucky. Next, Agent Cotter Houston of the Game Wardens was both interviewed and medically evaluated by Dr. Ian Harris. Agent Houston had his legs dematerialized after he tripped into a rising tide of anomalous liquid, which he described as looking like a moving physical computer glitch. However, in spite of this, Agent Houston is still able to stand and move of his own free will. It seemed to Dr. Harris that Houston's legs were somehow trapped between dimensions. Houston told Dr. Harris that he didn't experience any kind of pain when his legs were removed, but to this day he occasionally feels something furry brushing up against them. Perhaps wherever his legs are, they aren't alone. Next, the stoic Agent Munru of Samsara was interviewed by Captain Elliot O'Neill of Mobile Task Force D-26, also known as Time Cops. Captain O'Neill had a bone to pick with Munru, namely that he'd allow Captain Hollis to run off and sacrifice her own life despite having a clear directive to prevent the human task force members from endangering themselves at any cost. Munru deflected, claiming that when Hollis separated from the group, he assumed that she ran off with intentions that never included her own demise. O'Neill and the Foundation found this answer unsatisfying and decided to move on to their next interview with Onru, the last person with Captain Hollis before her death. The interviewer, Dr. Darian Arnold, probed the elite Samsara operative on why she turned off her camera before she and Hollis reached the Thresher, the machine that Hollis overloaded to annihilate Site-13 from our dimension. She gave a more compelling answer than Munro. When she and Hollis entered the server room on the way to the Thresher, they encountered what might have been the ultimate cognito hazard. It was a vision of a terrifying alternate dimension with billions dead. A poisoned star like the biblical wormwood fell from the burning sky. A nightmare god like the one torturing Elliot Emerson wandered along the fields of crucified people, covered in deadly cognito hazardous runes. Just looking at it burned the scramble technology out of Moonru's eyes, and she quickly turned off her cameras to avoid potentially frying the brains of mission control. Hollis wasn't so lucky. The things she witnessed broke her sanity, and when she finally overloaded the Thresher machine, she was laughing and crying. Finally, in perhaps the most enlightening debriefing interview of them all, Site Director William Vesterlin interviewed Dr. Muhammad Scott, the highest-ranking researcher of Site-13 and confidant of the now-infamous Director Elliot Emerson. The question was simple, 
just what had happened for Site 13 to become so messed up, and Dr. Scott answered in detail with a tale of corruption, alternate realities, and the perils of unchecked power. In his home dimension, Site 13 was originally created in Nome, Alaska to house the corpse of a giant sea creature that beached itself on the border of India and Bangladesh in 1964. It became the largest and most secretive foundation containment facility in the latter half of the 20th century. However, disaster struck in 1994 when a Marxist extremist used an anomaly to level the Willis Tower in Chicago. As a result, the foundation lost a lot of its funding and international support, leaving it in dire financial straits. Enter the true villain of the Site 13 story, Paul Manafort. If that name sounds familiar to you, it's because he was an associate of President Trump in our universe who got into legal trouble for shady international dealings. However, in Dr. Scott's universe, he was a powerful staffer for President Bob Dole, who in that reality had beaten Bill Clinton in the 1996 presidential election. Manafort was made the new Secretary General of the Global Occult Coalition, the UN's answer to the SCP Foundation, and one of their leading competitors, with an ethos geared toward killing rather than containing anomalies. Manafort and the GOC co-opted the struggling foundation, providing them with money in exchange for control. The foundation had no choice but to accept the deal with the devil. Slowly, Manafort replaced the foundation old guard with toadies and loyalists. The ethics committee and the O5 command were dismantled. Dissenters were dragged out of their offices and shot point-blank in the head execution style. Site 13 had originally been directed by Dr. Bright, but Bright was arrested and contained under false pretenses, so Manafort could install a new director, a mid-level researcher by the name of Elliot Emerson. Emerson is often painted as a sadistic monster who took pleasure in torturing torturing anomalies to death and flushing them down the body pit. The reality is both simpler and more grim. Emerson, it turns out, was just an eager yes-man. He was put into his position to follow Manafort's orders to a T, and those orders were simple – kill. In a perfect example of the banality of evil, Dr. Emerson converted Site 13 into a brutal slaughterhouse, just as his overlords at the GOC had ordered him. But things were quickly getting out of hand, and one of the most vocal critics of the new regime was one of Emerson's old lovers, one Dr. Vera Hadley assistant director of anomalous biology. Dr. Hadley was disgusted by the inhuman acts Emerson was carrying out and couldn't stay silent, and for this she faced horrific consequences. Corrupt guards stripped her and beat her to within an inch of her life in front of her co-workers. In that moment, she swore her revenge. She sabotaged the containment procedures and had the engineers rig the already unstable thresher device to overload. As Emerson watched the anomalies break containment, he began to fear for his life, both from the anomalies themselves and from the punishments of his superiors at the GOC. Dr. Scott revealed that Emerson was no evil mastermind. He was a lapdog for the GOC, a dirty coward all the way to the very end, and he was desperate. He held Dr. Scott at gunpoint and ordered him to activate the thresher or die, and the rest is history. There would be no redemption for Dr. Scott's former friend, as Emerson ended up chained to the room-covered platform head of a nightmare god for all eternity. So ends the debriefing of the Site 13 survivors, and closes the book on that terrible place, for now anyway. The story of SCP-1730 is anything but simple, and there are so many angles from which this dark tragedy of cruelty and corruption can be approached, and ultimately, it was all for the same two things at the root of every evil, the desire for money and power. But the pursuit of these base desires can lead to some truly nightmarish consequences, and nobody knows this better than former director Elliot Emerson, who will be paying for these sins until the end of time, and perhaps even beyond. The desert is still. The night seems endless, silent, and at peace, until it's pierced by the sound of gunshots and screams. Deep in the Sahara, the SCP Foundation is waging war against a newly discovered enemy. A squad of Foundation agents is retreating, trying to get away from the ones who massacred their allies. They were attempting to eliminate the threat using conventional means, but their rifles were no match for the reality-bending entities of the Kingdom of Abaddon. The retreating agents cover one another as they make their way back to the extraction point. The enemy force advances. Agents that are caught too close to the sorcerers of Abaddon disintegrate into thin air. This is not an enemy they can defeat. The SCP agents need to get back to base and relay what they have found to their superiors. Out of the hundreds of agents sent into the Sahara that night, only a handful make it out alive. They are debriefed by their superiors at the Foundation who classified the anomalous humanoids under the highest of threat levels. The Kingdom of Abaddon is a threat. The Kingdom of Abaddon must be eliminated.
Reconnaissance done prior to the disastrous mission had alerted the Foundation to the presence of anomalies in the region, but they had no idea how strong the anomalous humanoids would be. From data gathered through old reports, it seemed like the Abaddon humanoids were responsible for the deaths of no fewer than 75 Foundation personnel, and had stolen at least 12 different items from the Foundation. The leaders of the SCP Foundation tasked research team Omega-5 with developing a weapon that would be capable of destroying the Kingdom of Abaddon once and for all. The weapon they are researching must be capable of long-range destruction, because the moment any Foundation agent gets close to the area, they are vaporized by the reality-manipulating powers of its inhabitants. The project is given the name Twins of God, and is led by a Foundation doctor known only by the designation O-5-1. O-5-1 is popular in the SCP Foundation, well known for his in-depth research and charismatic personality, making him the perfect person to lead such a project. And O-5-1 recently came across an anomaly that he believes holds the solution the Foundation has been looking for to defeat the Kingdom of Abaddon. Item 001. And so the Omega-5 team gets to work. They discover that the anomaly has incredible powers when put inside a host, which they refer to as an Item 001 entity, and set up a series of experiments using different people to harness its energy. The first series of tests all end in tragedy. The anomaly causes the entity it inhabits to become intensely radioactive. Anyone who gets close to it succumbs to immediate radiation sickness, and eventually, death. To stop the radiation problems, the Omega-5 research group intensifies the containment procedures. O-51 receives reports from the higher-ups that the Kingdom of Abaddon has attacked another Foundation facility in Sudan. Long-range defense is needed ASAP. The Administrator puts more pressure on Omega-5, and especially its leader O-51, to solve the problems of Item 001 and develop a weapon that can save the Foundation. He stays awake for days on end, working tirelessly to create a safe and controllable Item 001 entity. Although there are signs that the weapon will work, it is still unpredictable. When Item 001 is initiated, the host entity becomes paralyzed, suffers severe cerebral hemorrhaging, and soon a new host is needed before testing can begin again. And that's not the only thing that goes wrong. Whenever the anomaly is put into a new host, sudden and random destruction of on-site structures and personnel take place. O51 knows, though, that if this power can be harnessed and controlled in the right way, that it could be the weapon that the Foundation needs to wipe out the Kingdom of Abaddon once and for all. In order to control Item 001, O51 has a mind kill switch implanted in its host's brains. O51 can activate the implant to incapacitate its host and immediately stop the unwanted destruction. Countless hosts are terminated by this mind kill switch in the early trials conducted by the Omega-5 team, but progress continues to be made, and eventually a hypothesis is formulated. Perhaps the disastrous side effects of Item 001 can be offset by spreading the anomaly across multiple subjects. They theorize that the immense mental load of the anomaly can be distributed among several hosts, thus reducing the toil it takes on each and giving them the ability to control its immense power. But O51 and the Omega-5 team need more data, and for that, they need more bodies. They consult with the director of Site-17, and it is concluded that the nearby town of San Marco would be an appropriate place to get the additional test subjects they require. On a quiet Sunday morning, Omega-5, along with support from a squad of armed SCP agents, storm into the San Marcos de la Vida Sterna Church during the middle of Mass. They gather up a number of the younger congregants and bring them back to the site where Item 001 is housed. The researchers quickly ran through their new supply of test subjects, though and Omega-5 would need to get even more if their research was to continue. Instead of going back and forth between the testing facility and San Marcos, O51 decided to move the entire Item 001 operation to the town itself. He renames the town Testing Site 001, and Omega-5 rounds up 23 of the healthiest subjects they can find for use in the next series of research yeah. tests. A few weeks after occupying the town of San Marco, Omega-5 makes its most substantial progress yet. Just as they theorized, by spreading out the anomaly of Item 001 across a specific group of hosts, they can control its powers. The test may have cost the lives of almost everyone in the town, but the ends certainly justify the means. The Kingdom of Abaddon poses an existential threat to the SCP Foundation, after all, and thanks to this research, they will soon have a weapon capable of bringing them victory. The Foundation Administer criticized O51's methods, but can't argue with his results. 
Unfortunately, O51 has a dark secret. A secret that disturbs even the most hardened and loyal members of Omega-5. A secret that has to do with the item O01 hosts. The hosts that Omega-5 has made its major progress with are not the ordinary test subjects normally used by the Foundation. No, the test subjects O51 makes his breakthrough with are children. Nine of them, to be exact, all between 4 and 11 years old. Despite being told specifically by the Foundation Administrator to only test on adults, the research required O51 to break the chain of command and follow the science down the path it led. The children are contained in a reinforced bunker where only O51 and a select few have access. They are technically alive, but are functionally brain dead. The group of nine children share a hive mind that can process information and more importantly, can unleash the full potential of the implanted anomaly, creating and controlling a devastating power. But not everyone is thrilled with what they've achieved. Members of Omega-5 are haunted by the screams of the children that they force to be part of their weapons development program. They describe their merging with item 001 as being a process that rips out their souls and replaces them with something much more sinister. In fact, all of Omega-5 regret what they have been a part of, and what they've done, all except 051. The nine children can channel unprecedented amounts of energy from an unknown origin that Omega-5 hypothesizes comes from an extra-dimensional source, which is then used to unbind atoms at the quantum level. When the right activation words are spoken, it appears as though this tremendous power gives the children the ability to annihilate anything in the entire universe. It's a gun to end all guns and only O51 has the key to control it. The Nine Children works so well with an item 001 that Omega-5 reclassifies it to include the Nine Children themselves. They are not just the entity housing or controlling item 001, they permanently become item 001. Once Omega-5 has a better understanding of item 001, they begin to run tests to find out the full extent of its abilities. First, they test the distance item 001 can reach. The initial test that Omega-5 carries out is on a steel rod placed 5 kilometers away. O51 orders the children to destroy the target. Moments later, the phone next to O51 begins to ring. When he picks it up, the observer tasked with watching the pole is on the other end. He informs O51 that the steel rod has been completely vaporized. O51 is not satisfied though. He has another pole sent out this time placed 8,000 kilometers away from the nine children. O51 asks the children to destroy that rod. Almost immediately, the phone rings again. The target has been vaporized. O51 smiles. The next series of tests Omega-5 runs on item 001 are to determine the maximum size of an object that can be destroyed. The tests start out with a steel sphere, three meters in diameter, placed 1,000 kilometers from item 001. O51 orders the children to destroy the object. It is instantly vaporized. O51 has seen enough small tests. It's time for something big. So he does something that will later be questioned by everyone at the SCP Foundation. He orders the nine children to destroy a Church of the Broken God worship site in Turkey. Not long after the destruction order is given to item 001, reports begin coming in. The worship site has been obliterated with no observable damage to the surrounding area deadly and precise. O51 closes his eyes and takes a deep breath. He looks as if he's overcome by an immense spiritual experience. He opens his eyes, leans over to the children, and whispers the name of someone. Later that day, O51 finds out that the target he had named has been vaporized. The success of Omega-5 in item 001 is relayed to the administration of the Foundation. They are so impressed that they make plans to use Item 001 to eliminate the Abaddon threat once and for all. However, one of the heads of the Foundation, Administrator Williams, has major concerns about the way O51 is running the program. The updates that O51 has been sending have become less scientific and more philosophical, more spiritual. Administrator Williams sends a letter to O51 reassuring him that he is doing good work. But once the mission to destroy the Kingdom of Abaddon is completed, O51 will be promoted to Director and reassigned to the newly constructed Site-19. For the good of the Foundation, and maybe the rest of the world, he'll be permanently moved away from Item 001. 
051's response is short and to the point. I am fine, Administrator. The project is finished. We will complete our task when you arrive. Administrator Williams arrives at Site-001 a few days later. He is greeted by 051 and the Omega-5 team. Williams can't help but notice that 051 has a strange look in his eyes. It is the look of a crazed man who has been lost in his work and who has, perhaps, lost himself. Williams puts the thought away, though, and walks with 051 and his accompanying agents to the viewing area where the powers of Item 001 will be demonstrated. Administrator Williams and the other agents watch from a protected viewing room as 051 enters the chamber of his new super weapon. It's time to see if their weapon that has had so much time, effort, sweat, tears, and especially blood poured into it will have been worth it. Everyone watches as 051 leans over and says the name of the Abaddon Citadel to the nine children. All at once, they start to glow. No one observing can see what has happened in the far-off kingdom, but they know something big has happened. The administrator is thrilled, but notices something. 051 hesitated a moment while leaning over the children before standing back up. Did he whisper something else to them? And then Administrator Williams vaporizes, pulled apart at an atomic level before he has the chance to scream. What's going on? The agents standing next to where Administrator Williams previously existed begin to yell and pull out their guns. They burst through the door of the observation room and run down the hallway towards where 051 and the nine children are located. The arm agents rush into the room, but 051 is gone. The nine children are still. Over the next few weeks, 051 is reported to be seen several times by SCP agents. However, no one is able to catch him, and it appears as though other members of the SCP Foundation have also gone AWOL as well, perhaps joining him on the run. It is unclear what his plan is, but the reports from the reconnaissance team sent into the Sahara make it obvious what the result of his first command to the children was. There isn't a single humanoid or building left in the Kingdom of Abaddon. But even with this victory, the highest levels of the SCP Foundation have an ominous thought lurking in the back of their minds. Where did 051 go? And what is he planning to do next? Following the improper use of item 001 leading to the untimely death of a high-ranking Foundation staff member, the weapon was deemed too dangerous and containment procedures were implemented. Due to the high amount of radiation they were found to emit, the nine children were placed into lead-lined bags and buried under 50 meters of concrete beneath the church of San Marcos de la Vida Eterna. Though all of the children continued to be functionally brain-dead, they still display signs of life despite their containment, and by order of the Overseer Council, have been classified as a Thaumiel entity. It's a natural instinct in many species to protect their young, and sometimes it's not just their own babies, but any young that look like them. Regardless of your personal feelings on humans' earliest stage, it is a scientific fact that human babies are designed to emphasize their own adorable helplessness to make sure that other, older humans take care of them. A baby's cry is an inherently distressing sound, and when we hear it, some deep primal part of us feels the urge to comfort and care for the child until the sound stops. But of course, we're talking about the world of the SCP Foundation here, where there are bunnies that can eat anything, teddy bears that might steal your organs to make duplicates of themselves, and chocolate fountains filled with trillions of murderous insects. Nothing is what it seems here, and even the most innocent and cute creatures may be hiding a deadly secret. SCP-734 being no exception. Today we're talking about the baby. This anomaly proves that dangerous things can come in small packages, but where others only saw misery and death, the SCP Foundation saw a certain potential. Our story begins in the maternity ward of a hospital in the USA, where every medical professional's worst nightmare was unfolding. An unknown but incredibly fast-acting, flesh-eating pathogen seemed to be running rampant across the hospital's population. It began when patients who weren't even admitted for dermatological issues started complaining of severe itches and extreme skin pain. Some nurses and doctors in the maternity ward began to experience similar symptoms, as well as one of the infants, leading to a massive quarantine effort. While the initial symptoms first appeared to be limited to severe pain and discomfort on isolated parts of the skin, the condition of the afflicted soon escalated. 
Their skin began to messily flake off as the cells comprising it lost physical cohesion and died. It was a kind of strange, anomalous rot that seemed to work inwards, first destroying the integrity of the outer layer of skin and then cause further disintegration to deeper parts of the body. Once the skin had shut off, the pathogen would turn its attention to what was lying beneath. Against all odds, the disease affected organs, muscle tissue, the vascular system, and even bones. Nothing was spared. The victims' bodies would completely break down, and they would be dead within a few hours. By the time the pathogen had finished ravaging its victims, what was left didn't even look human anymore. Not only patients, but doctors and nurses that had been walking the wards mere hours before were now little more than piles of human tissue sitting in what had previously been their hospital beds. Whatever this was, it seemed like the fastest progressing infection in recorded history. Hospital staff and administrators were terrified. This appeared to be an entirely new disease, with a mysterious form of transmission and, worst of all, no cure. They were even more confused when several black vans pulled up outside the hospital and mysterious men in hazmat suits spilled out and began setting up a quarantine zone around the entire building. Whoever these strange people were, they definitely weren't the CDC. Little did the hospital personnel know that this was the group you'd never want showing up and putting your location on lockdown. It was the SCP Foundation. The infected remains of the victims were taken away for research purposes, and the Foundation operatives immediately began conducting debriefing interviews with witnesses. They soon determined from a mix of eyewitness accounts and hospital surveillance footage that everyone infected with the mysterious pathogen had all been in a particular section of the maternity ward earlier in the day. And when the operatives investigated this area, they found another strange detail. An infant had no registered mother present in the hospital. The Foundation would later learn that this was likely because the baby's mother was the first victim of the deadly disease. After eliminating all other possible options, it seemed that the only anomalous element that could have caused all of this was the mysterious baby. Though just how the mother even survived carrying the baby to term was a mystery in and of itself. The baby was a Caucasian male human infant between 7 and 8 months of age. Nothing appeared outwardly anomalous about the child, but they could confirm that every single victim of the anomalous pathogen had come into physical contact with the child earlier that day. Everyone who had been at the hospital was given amnestic treatment, and the Foundation constructed plausible cover stories for the deaths that had occurred that day. Like so many others before it, the child was secured and spirited away to the nearest applicable Foundation containment site. There it was reclassified SCP-734. And finally, the real testing into what precisely this infant was capable of could begin. Physiologically, SCP-734 appeared mostly non-anomalous. The infant had above-average intelligence and physical aptitude for a child his age but otherwise showed no mutations or abnormalities that would suggest a divergence from typical human biology. Despite a vast array of tests performed by the Foundation into essentially every aspect of 734's biology, they couldn't find anything that hinted at the origin of the mysterious pathogen. But through some trial and extremely costly error, the Foundation was able to learn more about how exactly the pathogen worked. The only vector for transmission seemed to be direct contact with the baby itself, up to and including the fluids and residues it leaves behind. Those affected cannot transmit the anomalous flaking effect to others, meaning the risk of an epidemic is relievingly minimal. But of course, accidents still happen, as was discovered when one agent misplaced her sympathy for the baby and decided to remove her mask while interacting with him. Her logic was that her masked face might have caused the baby some kind of distress, and as long as she was only coming into contact with him via her own gloved hands, everything would be fine. But some dust particles were floating in the air at the time, and SCP-734 sneezed in her face. The agent began screaming in pain and recoiling from the baby, but it was already too late. Her fate was sealed. She was taken to the infirmary and given sedatives so that she could hopefully die in as little pain as possible. In roughly 72% of cases, amputation of the affected areas has prevented the entire body from succumbing to the anomalous effects of SCP-734. 
But this isn't exactly feasible, where the point of contact is the victim's head. Within hours, the agent's flesh had flaked off her face, leaving her looking like a red, bloody skull. A few hours after that, she didn't have a head at all. Throughout the disintegration process of this unfortunate agent, the Foundation took grisly photographs. These photographs are shown to anyone preparing to work on the SCP-734 research project to teach them a hard lesson on the importance of adhering to proper safety protocols. And these protocols about how to deal with the baby are incredibly tight, given that even incidental contact is often a death sentence. Anyone entering the baby's containment chamber needs to wear contained atmosphere hazmat suits. Anyone who makes physical contact with the baby, even when suited up, is immediately removed from the area and subject to several hours of quarantine and observation. Even inanimate objects that have been inside the containment chamber need to be thoroughly sterilized before being removed. Given that even anomalous children like SCP-734 have very delicate needs, a handler is always standing by in full hazmat gear to take care of the baby. These handlers are rotated every hour to maintain alertness and safety. These handlers feed and change SCP-734 regularly, and sometimes even provide toys that have been approved by the O5 Council. The Foundation has gone to great lengths to keep SCP-734 alive and comfortable, because they believe that SCP-734 could be an important asset for them in the future. Or, more specifically, they see great strategic value in SCP-734's blood. As mentioned earlier, contact with any matter from SCP-734 triggers its deadly anomalous effects, including bodily fluids like blood. But unlike many toxic pathogens, in this case, there is no risk of the infection getting out of control since the infected do not become vectors for transmission. Because of this, the blood of SCP-734 can act as a powerful weapon for both terminating anomalies deemed unviable by the O5 Council and assassinating dangerous people who belong to rival groups. Contact with the blood would completely destroy the target's body, with no other anomalous effects and no evidence of who exactly conducted the hit. SCP-734 has been fitted with an arterial catheter so that the Foundation can collect large quantities of blood from the anomalous infant every single week for storage and research. But it isn't just the blood that the Foundation sees potential in. SCP-734 himself has scored incredibly well on the Esslinger Loyalty Index, the test the Foundation uses to judge the loyalty of potential applicants to the Foundation cause. As SCP-734 matures, if these scores remain consistent, he will likely be trained to become a Foundation field agent in the future. An agent capable of killing someone with a touch would, needless to say, be an asset to certain covert missions that the Foundation would probably prefer to keep off the books. Of course, the SCP Foundation recruiting certain compliant anomalies to perform missions for them is far from unprecedented. The most infamous of these is SCP-076, also known as Abel a supernatural, eternally resurrecting swordsman, and perhaps one of the finest warriors who ever lived. The Foundation took note of this, and channeled his eternal thirst for battle into working with his very own mobile task force. He could assist in missions by taking out his bloodlust on enemy groups of interest and dangerous anomalies. However, this ended up working a little too well and led to disaster. Abel was so good at his job that he burned through all of his allotted missions at astonishing speed. Left with nothing more to do, Abel got antsy, which led him to turning his murderous desires on his fellow team members, and then the Foundation as a whole. It was an all-out massacre before his colleagues were finally able to kill him and return him to containment. The failure of this initiative gave the very idea of letting anomalies work for the Foundation in the field a bad name. But since then, things have changed, especially with the establishment of MTF Alpha 9, aka Last Hope a new mobile task force formed entirely of anomalous individuals and their handlers. These consist of somewhat more stable anomalies, such as Abel's counterpart SCP-073, also known as Kane. Kane cannot be harmed, with any harm befalling him simply being mirrored back on his attacker, and his vast array of knowledge makes him an incredibly useful intelligent asset. Another of the several members of Last Hope is Iris, also known as SCP-105. Much like Kane, Iris not only has anomalous powers that make her immensely valuable for missions in the field, she's also compliant and capable of listening to reason, 
Unlike Kane, her abilities include being able to actively surveil and even interact with photos of any location, especially when taken with her anomalous camera. Someday, SCP-734 could count himself among other anomalous Foundation agents like these, providing he continues to show promise and doesn't develop a dislike of the Foundation as he ages, since after all, he won't be a baby forever. So if you ever find yourself on the Foundation's bad side, you have a good reason to be paranoid. You'll have no idea that one day, the man who's going to kill you will approach and shake your hand with a smile. It won't be until later, when you feel that strange tingle on your palm and feel the skin starting to flake away, that you'll realize you've been a dead man walking for hours. What's in a name? Ancient folklore and fairy tales sometimes tell of the importance of names, that they can hold the power to summon or banish. Whether you buy into the superstition or not, you'd be unwise to ignore the power a name can have, especially if you ever dare to venture into SCP-4000. Why? Use your own name too many times in this extra-dimensional forest, and you may find that what walks out isn't you at all. At least once a year, the Foundation leads an expedition into SCP-4000 to explore this Keter-class dimension. But if you go down to those woods today, then you'd better follow the rules. Remember, the Foundation has implemented these guidelines for your own safety, and it's in your best interests to follow them. First and foremost, when referencing anything inside SCP-4000, be it a person, place, or thing, you cannot, under any circumstances, use names or titles. Communication is key when exploring SCP-4000, and making use of specific descriptors will deter any adverse effects on your journey. For example, you may want to refer to the location of SCP-4000 as the woods where you need to speak carefully, an apt description for such a place. Of course, there is a reason the Foundation doesn't provide a handy flashcard of alternative descriptors for any personnel taking part in the annual mission into SCP-4000. Nothing found there can be referred to with any consistent name, so it's perhaps advisable to look over a thesaurus and expand your vocabulary before visiting SCP-4000, as you'll need to come up with a lot of different ways to refer to the people and creatures around you. But don't worry, the Foundation will be able to train you how to properly refer to SCP-4000 in both written and verbal communication. In a similar vein, the second rule states that no personnel member should respond to their own name while in SCP-4000. Naturally, you and your fellow expedition team will not be alone in the forest you find yourselves in. The denizens of SCP-4000 are perpetually mutating creatures, some appearing to be trustworthy while others are hostile. It is for personnel members' own safety that no consistent names or titles are used to refer to each other in conversation. Conversation. This has been known to cause personnel returning from SCP-4000 to experience vivid hallucinations, and in some instances has led to the appearances of creatures found in SCP-4000 in our world. Thirdly, when interacting with the life forms residing in SCP-4000, personnel are advised to accept any gifts that they're offered, but are warned to, under no circumstances, consume anything that is given to them while inside the forest. Finally, and above all, do not divulge any name, nickname, codename, alias, or any other personal designation when interacting with any native entities, and disregard any designator that an inhabitant of SCP-4000 attempts to assign to you. Personnel must, however, remain courteous in the presence of any native creature of SCP-4000, and treat these entities with respect and formality. Access to SCP-4000 can only be achieved by performing Procedure 4000 Holloway, a ritual requiring a steady flame in an indoor fireplace fueled by only organic kindling. Personnel are required to combine the powdered bones of one male lion, one male red fox, and a baleen whale, and cast these into the fire with a personal possession holding strong sentimental value to the staff member performing 4000 Holloway. Next, personnel are to add three feathers of a bird, such as a raven or crow, and must respond with the correct counterphrases once the fire begins to emit a voice. If these conditions are met and the correct response is given, Foundation personnel will gain access to the entry point of SCP-4000. If any error is made during the course of performing Procedure 4000 Holloway, then under no circumstances should this ritual be repeated. Staff are urged to apologize for any incorrect actions, then refrain from engaging in this procedure in the future. Should Procedure 4000 Holloway be completed successfully, Foundation personnel will find themselves arriving in the access point to SCP-4000, emerging from the mouth of an old well in the center of the forest. Exploration teams sent into SCP-4000 are advised that this dimension does not adhere to the laws of physical space that personnel will be accustomed to. There is a single, confirmed, safe route that must be used 
when traversing the forest of SCP-4000, a dirt path leading in a circuit both beginning and terminating at the entry point. Previous attempts to map the landscape of SCP-4000 all confirmed that the only way to safely exit this dimension is to follow the entire length of the path in one direction until eventually returning to the well. You have been warned. Any attempt to travel back to the direction you came in will result in a loss of contact with the rest of the expedition team. As mentioned, SCP-4000 is home to a number of entities, often noted to be undergoing continuous and dramatic changes in form. These physiological mutations appear to occur whenever these creatures are unobserved, making distinguishing between them difficult. When questioned about the exact nature of these changes, the inhabitants of SCP-4000 claim to have no control over them and express distress and dissatisfaction when said changes occur. Guidelines have been put in place by the Foundation regarding the interactions between personnel and creatures found in the forest, and adhering to the rules regarding the use of consistent names and titles remains vitally important. The native creatures appear semi-humanoid and are reported to be highly temperamental. Should any staff member happen to offend one of these natives, they may be subjected to anything from verbal assault to acts of extreme physical violence from the SCP-4000 resident. If any Foundation personnel further question why there are so many rules when visiting SCP-4000, then they need to look no further than the discoveries and fate of Dr. Eugene Japers, who during his initial expedition to SCP-4000 in 2005 encountered a humanoid native entity whose head resembled a rabbit's. As the pair shared a polite conversation, the rabbit-like creature made an inquiry regarding Dr. Japers' name, asking, how is your name? Keeping to the rules, Dr. Japers did not divulge any name or other form of title to the creature at this time. However, Japers remained courteous and polite during the interaction. The rabbit responded with the following, are you simple? I'm merely asking how your name is. My name has smelt of raspberries lately, I think, or snapdragons perhaps. It's so hard to tell these days, but one makes an effort. In his reply, Dr. Japers made a reference to his own name as having tasted rather tart as of late. Before concluding the conversation with the rabbit entity, upon returning to the SCP-4000 forest three years later, Dr. Japers was met with the same creature and once again engaged in conversation with it. After briefly discussing their previous encounter, Dr. Japers was able to turn their exchange towards something the rabbit had mentioned before, about finding it difficult to describe his own name. When asked to clarify this point, the rabbit replied, I can only assume it's because of how long we've been apart, my name and I, that is. It's a good name, a proud name, I'm fairly sure. By this point, though, it's probably decayed from its former grandeur, if it even still exists. After this mention of its relationship with its own name, it should be noted that the rabbit referred to Dr. Japers by the title Fellow Scholar. The third and final encounter between Dr. Japers and this entity came in 2013, after the doctor was sent into SCP-4000 with instructions to conduct a more thorough interview with the subject. It was during their third conversation that the rabbit man revealed details of a long-forgotten war between human beings and the residents of SCP-4000. Apparently, these creatures, the Fae, do not originate from the forest in which they now reside, and according to the rabbit man's claims, were born in our world. Much as it grieves me to say, we were betrayed, the rabbit explained. We had fought side by side, you know, in the war against that factory. We had done nothing but help them, and what did they do? They destroyed us. They took so many of our lives and all of our names. Some of us fled here when the war was just beginning, but not many. Not many. Still though, I don't hate them. It has been assumed by some that the Foundation was directly involved in whatever may have wiped out the Fae, causing them to either retreat or be banished to the forest of SCP-4000. An additional assumption has been made that whatever weapons were used on these creatures is directly responsible for their constantly shifting state, rendering them without their own names or identities. Whatever the case may be, it was during their conversation that Dr. Japers, in reference to their second encounter, referred to himself as a fellow scholar to the rabbit in order to coax information from him. However, in doing so, the doctor had unwittingly accepted the title that the native entity had given him. By mistakenly responding to the name Fellow Scholar, the doctor had broken the rules of interacting with the creatures of SCP-4000. An easy mistake, but a costly one. The doctor would later leave SCP-4000, traversing the safe path back to the well, and Dr. Japers vanished shortly after his exit from SCP-4000. His whereabouts are currently unknown. The Foundation has made several attempts to investigate his untimely disappearance, but to this day, he remains missing, and the fur left on the inside of his expedition gear displayed no strange properties. The single goal, it would seem, of the creatures residing in SCP-4000 is the theft of names. However, this naturally extends far beyond the Dimension's definition of identity theft. 
Though an unfortunate blunder, Dr. Japers allowed the friendly nature and demeanor of the rabbit entity to trick him into accepting the name Fellow Scholar. By giving Dr. Japers a name, the rabbit was free to steal not only his name but his very identity. While it is unclear how this transference is achieved by the creatures, it is due to the risk of this that the Foundation employs such strict rules for any research team tasked with traveling to the forest of SCP-4000. Make no mistake, names have more power than we realize, and this is evident in few places more so than SCP-4000, a pocket dimension where ever-changing survivors of a forgotten massacre exist as identities alone. Remember, a name is a powerful thing, whichever side of the well you find yourself on. Your name binds you to who you are, but if your name becomes someone else's, then what else of yours becomes theirs too. It all started in 1983, with reports of human trafficking in the heart of Sin City. The FBI had gotten word of a potential trafficking ring operating out of an abandoned department store in Las Vegas, Nevada, and immediately began organizing a secret raid on the building. While they would indeed encounter something horrifying within that abandoned department store, it wasn't criminals or human trafficking. In fact, it wasn't human at all. This is the horrifying story of SCP-847. After weeks of planning, the raid on the department store was conducted in the dead of night. Agents covered all the exits and entrances, and a helicopter was stationed nearby in case anyone attempted to run. It should have been a perfect trap, but things never go as planned when you don't know what you're dealing with. The agents breached the door and began searching the darkened building. It didn't appear that there was any power, so the traffickers must have had great night vision and a high tolerance for creepy locales. Agents soon heard a faint humming sound coming from below, a generator. It must be located in the basement and be the hub of this criminal enterprise. Readying themselves for whatever they were about to find, the agents descended into the basement. As they moved deeper into the building, they found that lighting rigs had been set up. They must be getting closer to something, but that something was still a mystery. A senior FBI special agent was leading the charge, his pistol drawn and ready. It was quiet, too quiet. Did the traffickers already realize they were coming and clear out? He was ready to consider this bust a bust when he heard a quiet mewling in the distance, a persistent whining whimper that was undeniably human. He gave the signal to his fellow agents to follow the noise. They proceeded forward towards the pain sounds and found themselves in a wide, well-lit room filled with department store mannequins. All were broken to some degree. Some were totally smashed to pieces. Some were chained to walls and locked in cages. Others were wrapped in plastic. The agent wondered whether this was some kind of twisted joke or a messed up avant-garde art piece. That's when he noticed her. A single crouch figure in the distance, hunched over and whimpering in a darkened corner of the room near a full-length mirror. He couldn't fully make her out, but he got the sense that something was wrong. She was injured, bent over. Was she even missing an arm? Just what have these monsters done to this woman? He whispered a request for backup into his radio and pushed on. When he got within 50 meters of this strange woman, her demeanor changed entirely. She jerked around, her movements forced, erratic and painful looking. The woman stared directly into the agent's eyes and began hobbling towards him, occasionally stopping to strike a pose as if modeling during a photo shoot. Just then, the agent made a horrifying realization. This thing moving towards them wasn't a woman at all. It was a living mannequin. As she got closer though, he realized that the mannequin's broken left forearm had been carved into a large shiv. A female junior FBI agent had been one of the many to pour into the room when the raid leader had radioed for backup. The second she entered the 50 meter range of this strange mannequin, everything changed. In an instant, its eyes and mouth began dripping with a thick, viscous resin. Its whimpering gasps suddenly became vicious, ear-splitting screeches, and it turned its gaze from the senior FBI agent. It was now focused on the junior agent, who had just entered the room and broke into a terrifying run straight towards her. The mannequin moved with a violent, single-minded purpose. Other agents began firing, but it was running freakishly fast and easily dodged most of the bullets. The few that actually hit seemed to do nothing to slow the creature down. It shrugged off the damage and kept running. With a great leap, it landed on the terrified junior agent and began jabbing her with its bladed arm. The other agents stopped firing, fearing they might accidentally hit their colleague during the panic. The mannequin was ruthless. 
clawing and stabbing with the strange resin leaking out of its every orifice. Terrified and unable to reach her gun, the agent remembered her training. She reached into her belt and grabbed her stun gun, jamming the two probes up against the creature's chest and giving it 30,000 volts. The creature spasmed, fell backwards, and collapsed in a heap on the ground, frozen. This was the first recorded encounter with SCP-847, a violent living mannequin with a serious problem with women. This terrifying report was passed up the chain of command until it landed on the desk of a Foundation agent working in the FBI. The Foundation quickly swooped in and claimed the mannequin, delivered necessary amnestic treatment to all who'd witnessed it, and closely observed the female junior FBI agent's recovery in a private hospital with Foundation ties. As it turns out, they were right to do so, as the junior agent was in for a gruesome fate. While the wound she'd suffered at the hands of SCP-847 didn't appear fatal, the fact that the mannequin's anomalous resin excretions entered the open wound changed everything. Several hours after being committed, the junior agent began complaining of limb stiffness and difficulty moving. This quickly developed into full paralysis. Over time, her skin and internal organs began to harden, until the process dubbed plastination came to a gruesome end. The junior agent wasn't just dead, she had been transformed into a mannequin. Foundation researchers were met with a truly horrifying realization. This means that all the other broken mannequins found with SCP-847 were likely once living humans, attacked and transformed by the anomaly, now a source for new harvested body parts. Now safely interred at a Foundation containment facility, though, the real tests on SCP-847 to determine its behavior and physical attributes could begin. The most important detail about SCP-847 is that its aggression is exclusively directed towards women, as opposed to when it encounters men, and its instincts are more self-destructive. Through a series of tests and observations, researchers have been able to pin down three different distinct patterns of behavior for SCP-847. Pattern Z behaviors occur when there are no humans standing within 50 meters of SCP-847. The mannequin will seek out a full-length mirror and pose in front of it, much like a department store mannequin attempting to show off its clothes. It remains largely inanimate during these periods and will very occasionally use a finger or whatever appendage is available, given its habit for self-mutilation, to scratch messages on nearby surfaces. Pattern Y behavior occurs when male humans with XY chromosomes enter a 50-meter radius around SCP-847. Just like its reaction to the male FBI agents who found it, 847 will initially emit vocalizations that seem like whimpering gasps, before making eye contact and striking provocative poses while approaching the subject. It will then remain static and allow the male subject to pose its body. However, after the male subject leaves the area, 847 will enter a state of considerable distress and begin removing or shattering parts of its body. The Foundation has found that the parts removed or shattered are often consistent with parts that the male subjects found displeasing during interactions, showing a masochistic desire to impress. These parts are then harvested back from plastinated victims, which brings us to the most dangerous of its behavior patterns. Pattern X behaviors occur when female humans enter a 50-meter radius around the creature. 847 will immediately become brutally aggressive, switching its noises from whimpers to violent screeches and growls. 847 experiences enhanced physical capabilities during Pattern X states. Its speed has been measured at 45 kilometers per hour, making it as fast as the legendary SCP-096. It's also been shown to exhibit extreme physical strength. It's during this pattern of behavior that it begins excreting its deadly resin, which has been proven to only be dangerous to women. In these states, the only thing capable of reliably pacifying the being is a powerful electric shock. The shock causes the creature's resin to harden, temporarily incapacitating it for roughly five minutes. 
Other conventional weapons and damage has no meaningful effect on SCP-847. After a number of incidents that had sad and violent endings, the Foundation Ethics Committee forbade the use of female D-Class personnel in SCP-847 testing. When it came to female subjects, 847 always slipped into a state of extreme aggression, so instead the Foundation began testing with male subjects in hopes of better understanding the dynamics between human males and SCP-847. Various misogynistic D-Class males were introduced into the containment chamber, which was modeled to look like a bedroom for the purposes of behavioral study. Each one, either during or after their interaction with SCP-847, was told to comment on some aspect they felt dissatisfied with. The mannequin shattered its own chest after hearing it described as being out of proportion. After another D-Class called its nose ugly, the mannequin broke it off. After another said that its hair was out of fashion and commented on its inability to drink, it tore out its hair and liver. All parts were replaced after the experiments. Things took their most violent and upsetting turn yet with the introduction of D-7294. A lot of the time, D-Class personnel are considered to be as anonymous as they are expendable. But D-7294 is an exception. Before becoming D-Class, he was a successful cello teacher who brutally murdered one of his teenage students and her mother. He's typically employed in tests when the Foundation wishes to see interactions between anomalies and humans with confirmed psychopathic personalities. During his interaction with SCP-847, he belittled and humiliated the mannequin. He forced it into uncomfortable poses and even snapped off one of its fingers before being dragged from the room by Foundation guards. In the following debrief, he further berated the mannequin as useless and lousy at its job of being controlled by him. In response, 847 extracted its own brains, eyes, and clavicle before shattering its own hands in dismay. So why does 847 behave this way? While it may appear monstrous, it seems that the reason SCP-847 does what it does is all too human. It hurts women because it itself is hurting, and it's willing to hurt itself even more for the approval of the objects of its desire. As a result, it's an anomaly trapped in an endless cycle of pain and violence. Perhaps one day, it'll be able to free itself from the loop, but that day is unlikely to come for this murderous mannequin anytime soon. The year was 1983, and seven-year-old Andrea Bradbury was wandering the streets of Nashville, Tennessee. One of her favorite activities was to head down to the local movie theater and fantasize about the movies she'd one day be old enough to see. This fateful weekend, Andrea's local theater was playing a brand new release, Jaws 3D. What she didn't know is that this simple, innocent activity would bring little Andrea into dangerous contact with SCP-178 and change her life forever. Jaws 3D isn't exactly a classic. It was one of the many forgettable sequels pumped out to cash in on the 3D craze of the early 1980s. People paid extra for the privilege of sitting in the dark with an uncomfortable pair of cardboard glasses while cheesy effects leapt out of the screen towards them. Many of the moviegoers simply threw away the cheap disposable glasses as soon as they left the theater, leaving them scattered on the sidewalk outside. Seeing a pair of 3D glasses on the ground, right there for the taking, was the highlight of Little Andrea's week. She may not have been old enough to see any of the movies, but she knew that a local shop sold books with images that popped out of the page with a simple pair of 3D glasses. Excited by the prospect of getting to experience 3D, Andrea grabbed a pair of glasses and ran straight for the bookstore. Later that night, she was in her bedroom, with a stereoscopic image of a Ferris wheel. Andrea adjusted the glasses, and the Ferris wheel really did pop right off the page. She marveled at the image coming out of the book and felt like she could almost touch it. But suddenly, a strange feeling came over her. She had the feeling that she wasn't… alone. Still wearing the glasses, Andrea looked up from her book and saw it, standing in the corner of her room, something huge, something monstrous. Andrea's parents heard her scream and came rushing into her room. There was their little girl, dead. It looked like she'd been mauled to death by a wild animal, but there was no sign of her killer. The windows were shut tight, unable to be opened from the outside. It was like whatever horrible creature had done this had vanished into thin air. 
The coroner's report didn't give any other clues as to who could have done this, except that whoever or whatever had murdered her, it appeared to have three long and incredibly sharp claws. The terrible tragedy of Andrea's death rocked Nashville, but it never made the national papers. Why? Because the SCP Foundation was immediately on the case. Undercover agents in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service flagged the strange death as anomalous, and SCP field personnel arrived to do their own investigation of the crime scene. There, they quickly discovered Andrea's 3D glasses, which would eventually be classified as SCP-178. An agent looked over the glasses. There didn't seem to be anything out of the ordinary about them, just your regular cardboard frames with blue and red tinted film over the eyes. Everything about them seemed normal, so he tried the glasses on for himself. He picked up the open book off the ground where Andrea had likely dropped it, and saw the Ferris wheel pop off the page. Nothing abnormal, until he turned his head slightly. He saw the head of some kind of… thing, only an inch away from his own, looking over his shoulder at the book. Being a trained SCP agent, he maintained his composure and looked around the room. As he did, he saw that several other creatures were standing and watching. None of the rest of the recovery team seemed to notice the creatures, and when the agent removed SCP-178, they vanished. It appeared they had found whatever had caused Andrea Bradbury's death. The glasses were immediately taken to the nearest Foundation containment site for further testing. Seeing these mysterious entities through SCP-178 may have answered one question, but it raised many others. What are these creatures? Were they real or merely illusions created by SCP-178? If they are real, are they somehow summoned by SCP-178 or simply revealed by them? There was already one death that could be tied to the glasses with some certainty, but just how dangerous were they? The SCP Foundation was about to find out. Foundation scientists devised a series of experiments, with a test chamber separated from an adjoining observation chamber by a panel of reinforced bulletproof glass. A member of D-Class personnel was placed into the test chamber, along with SCP-178. He was instructed to put on the glasses and report back what he saw to the researchers. The D-Class followed the orders. However, when he did so, he quickly entered a state of extreme distress. He threw away the glasses and covered his eyes, screaming wildly. When ordered to compose himself and explain what he saw under threat of termination, the D-Class described a hideous creature standing close to his face, watching. When asked to elaborate, he described it as having too many eyes. After that, the D-Class refused to put the glasses back on again, despite direct orders and threats from Foundation staff. He was then removed from the test chamber and observed. Although he experienced two days of mild paranoia, after 30 total days of observation, the D-Class was found to have no lasting psychological effects. Disappointed by the meager results of the first test, the researchers had at least confirmed that they did have an anomalous object in their possession, and pressed on with experimentation. They used the same methodology again on another D-Class. She was placed into the chamber and instructed to put on SCP-178, then describe the entity she saw in great detail. When she put on the glasses, she recoiled in horror at the monster she saw staring back at her. She said that the creature was tall and bipedal, with two additional upper appendages ending in large conical protrusions. She also described the creature's head as being smooth. When asked if the creature exhibited any kind of aggression or hostility, she said that it was completely still. It was just standing there. After a few minutes, though, the creature seemed to lose interest and began staring at the wall. The researchers were happy to learn more about the creature's physicality, but they still weren't confident that it wasn't just an illusion created by the glasses. They needed to engineer an interaction. For the next experiment, they decided to alter the particulars. A fractal blue and red image, in a similar style to the stereoscopic ferris wheel from the book Andrea had purchased, was fixed to one wall. Against the opposite wall, they placed a bucket containing ten standard tennis balls. This time, the D-Class, a convicted murderer and arsonist, was told he was helping to test a new 3D augmented reality project. The entities he would see, as far as he knew, were little more than digital projections. Though when he actually wore SCP-178 and saw them, he commented that whoever designed them must be crazy. 
The researchers instructed the D-Class to pick up a tennis ball and throw it at one of the entities. The second he did so, deep lacerations began appearing all over his body. The onslaught was brutal and quick, and the D-Class was dead soon after that. This confirmed to the researchers that the creatures did seem to have some level of tangible presence, and they could be extremely violent if provoked. Next, they wished to see if it was possible to have any kind of interaction with the creatures without it immediately descending into violence. To test this theory, the researchers brought a 19-year-old D-Class into the testing chamber under the same pretense of testing new 3D technology. Much like the others, she was still horrified by the appearance of the creatures, but was calmed down by the researchers. They asked her to speak to the creatures directly, without exhibiting any kind of aggression. She said, Hello, weird thing, how are you today? In a somewhat bored voice. And this was all it took to sign her death warrant. She was immediately slashed to death by invisible creatures. The results seemed clear. Any interaction whatsoever with the creatures while wearing SCP-178 was a death sentence, like a slightly more outgoing Shy Guy. But the researchers would soon find that this anomaly had even more surprises. For their next test, they brought in two subjects. One would wear SCP-178 and dictate to the other how they should interact with the creature they could not see. The results of this experiment were bloody, yet informative. Both subjects were slashed to death when the unseen D-Class interacted with one of the creatures on her companion's instructions. It appeared that anyone with sufficient knowledge of the creatures who attempts to interact with them is doomed, even if they can't directly see one of them. It was an upsetting realization for the researchers. SCP-178 may be much more dangerous than they initially imagined, and what they learn in the next experiment was even worse. They adopted the same methodology as the last for the following experiment. Two subjects, one seeing and the other interacting. However, this time, as soon as subject number one put on the glasses, they knew that something was terribly wrong. He began panicking, stating that the entire chamber was full of the creatures, all standing and watching. The researchers undertook these experiments knowing that they didn't often turn out well for the D-Class, so they didn't seem too worried about this new development. That is, until the subject stated that they could see three more of the creatures, and they weren't in the test chamber. They were in the observation room. In fact, one of them was looking right over one of the three researchers' shoulders. Immediately, the researchers lost composure and began to panic. They were used to putting D-Class in danger. That was part of the job but they weren't prepared for this. In just moments, the observation room became a bloodbath, as the three researchers who'd been designing and performing all of the experiments were torn to pieces by creatures they couldn't see. SCP-178 had gone from being one of the more innocent-looking anomalies to one of the most mysterious and deadly. The creatures seemed to be powerful, violent, and incredibly numerous. The fact that they can only be observed through 178 stereoscopic lenses and kill anyone who even attempts to interact with them makes them almost impossible to understand. It was always a tragedy when the Foundation lost good researchers, but the work must continue. And the experiments were soon restarted with increased safety measures. Of course, those didn't do much good, and after another disastrous experiment that resulted in the whole sector getting locked down, all research into SCP-178 was placed under increased scrutiny. They needed to find some way of observing the creatures, without the risk of having to share space with them. The proposed solution was seeing if the SCP-178 glasses were compatible with camera technology for remote viewing. Much like all stereoscopic glasses, they found that looking through only one lens at a time was ineffective. The solution was relatively simple a dual-lens camera in a roughly similar configuration to human eyes. This, however, didn't give them the comfort or the answers they hoped for. Researchers commented, upon finally seeing the creatures, that they were even more hideous than they'd ever imagined. As they observed a victim interacting with the creatures via their new camera, they found that as soon as the creatures were interacted with in any way, they would grow three long claws and attack. And they were as fast as they were ferocious. From the observations, there were only a few things that the Foundation now knew about them for sure. Their physical appearance, their violent nature, their enhanced physical abilities, and the fact they appeared to be pretty much everywhere. And who knows how long they'd been here, observing us humans while we glided by them, ignorant to their presence. It's enough to make you think twice before putting on a pair of 3D glasses again. 
But of course, never putting on the glasses doesn't mean you're safe. Just knowing about them puts you in danger. They could be standing next to you right now, looking over your shoulder as you watch this video. Just remember, if you want to be safe, you can't ever let them know you're aware. After all, just because you can't see something doesn't mean it can't hurt you. Ask yourself a simple question. Is the world around you real? It seems like the answer should be pretty obvious. Of course the world as you know it is real. How else would you be able to interact with it? Perhaps a better question would be this. How much do you trust that the world you know is real? How much do you believe that reality, as you experience it, is constant and cannot be changed by external forces? Now imagine, if you can, an entity to which the very fabric of reality is like clay, able to be shaped and molded at will. Then imagine that this entity, this malicious, twisted, and unknowable horror, has taken a special interest in you. If you can picture such a scenario, then you may as well be standing in the shoes of James Talleran, a Foundation researcher assigned to SCP-3999. Talleran could only have imagined what the Foundation kept contained in an airtight cell all the way at the bottom of a kilometer-long shaft and never expected that this was where his lifeless body would be found. Despite having the entity contained, the Foundation's only knowledge of SCP-3999 came from a text document discovered on Talleran's phone after his demise. Even their own records indicated that no such creature ever existed. Why? What could possibly shape reality in such a way that it could hide its own existence from the Foundation? And where was it now? The document on Talleran's phone yielded some evidence, seeming to be a long, rambling, and confused account of some sort of battle between a reality-shaping entity and the ill-fated researcher sent to examine it. Unlike many of the Foundation's documents, the entry for SCP-3999 is riddled with contradictions and strikethroughs, a confusing mess of information that makes piecing together the mysteries of Talleran's fate all the more difficult. Beneath the strange formatting and uncertainty surrounding SCP-3999 lies the tale of one man's torture for the amusement of an impossibly powerful and eternally sadistic creature. Based on the information available, it appears that SCP-3999 was fixated on Talleran. Upon his arrival to the Entity's cell, the researcher had no idea how long he would spend in the company of SCP-3999 or that he would never emerge alive. Many SCPs contained by the Foundation require their own specially made prisons in order to hold them and maintain the safety of Foundation staff as well as the outside world. But imagine if an SCP could turn the tables, bending the world around a single member of the Foundation, using all of reality as their own personalized torture chamber. The list of horrors endured by Talleran is both exhaustive and incomplete given the length of time he spent with the creature. Shortly after James Talleran was assigned to Site-118, where SCP-3999 was contained, the entity was somehow able to breach containment and began to twist the world around it in the name of a singular, cruel objective, the torture of James Talleran. The creature, while having no physical description, possessed the capability to cause either a CK-class reality restructuring event or a ZK-class end-of-reality event. SCP-3999 was somehow able to both destroy reality itself while simultaneously rebuilding it around its prisoner, Researcher Talleran. Every creature, person, and machination that SCP-3999 created was done so with the express intention of making Talleran suffer horribly over the course of millions of years, according to the researcher's own writings. The exact details of how SCP-3999 tortured Talleran are littered throughout the document he was found with but it is apparent that the entity was able to use its reality-altering abilities to continually revive the man after killing him as a way to prolong his pain. SCP-3999 seemed to be able to use its powers however it pleased, but focused all its attention and actions on causing misery for one man. It simply enjoyed inflicting suffering. One of the examples of the atrocities James Talleran suffered at the mercy of a cold, remorseless creature was witnessing the deaths of others. Although they were constructed and controlled by SCP-3999, Talleran saw trained Foundation security personnel drag three people into the cell. 
he recognized them instantly as his own family. Talaran was made to watch as his mother, father, and sister were executed with a single gunshot to the head by members of the same organization that he was a part of. All of Talaran's professional colleagues were also killed in front of him, followed by anyone and everyone that had come into contact with James Talaran, including the O5 Council. He was made to watch as they were systematically murdered one by one, all for the enjoyment of SCP-3999. At some point during the creature's torture of Talaran, there appears to have been some attempt to contain SCP-3999 within another SCP, SCP-2432, a room within a hotel now owned by the Foundation that appears to compel its guests to write exaggerated positive reviews after staying there. When introduced to SCP-2432, SCP-3999's ability to alter reality seemed to have the effect of creating a dimensional anomaly within the hotel. A crawlspace opened up in SCP-2432, leading to an almost identical room. The front door of this new room, designated SCP-2432-1, led to an alternate dimension that resembled the hotel housing SCP-2432. The rooms of this new version of the SCP-2432 hotel were a seemingly infinite, endless loop of rooms. This dimension also played host to a number of strange creatures, as uncovered by Foundation research teams that ventured there. Most notably, a creature resembling a male Homo sapien, calling itself Researcher Talaran. This being was dressed in clothing similar to Foundation researchers, and appeared nervous and confused when approached by personnel, only to be executed when asked to be told the location of SCP-3999. Later during SCP-3999's 3 million year torture session, James Talaran was interviewed with another doctor working for the Foundation. The interviewing doctor had no recollection of Talaran's assignment to SCP-3999, and both James's involvement with the Foundation and the very existence of SCP-3999 were expunged from the Foundation's database. As Talaran desperately tried to rationalize what was happening to him, he told the interviewer, I have trouble focusing on things now. I just feel a lot of unease. It's like reality has started to feel less real, if that makes sense. Shortly after, he attempted to ask the doctor for his name and for him to identify which of the Foundation sites they were at. In response, the doctor emitted a strange noise from his mouth, confusing Talaran. That's not a name. You just made a noise with your mouth, the researcher replied. Why am I thinking of redactions? How can a word be redacted like that in a normal conversation? Following this, the floor beneath James Talleran's feet disappeared, and he was swallowed by darkness, as SCP-3999 continued bending reality to make him suffer. What followed were multiple failed attempts from Talleran to either escape from the entity or nullify its abilities to warp reality. SCP-3999 had, at a later point, trapped Talaran in a stage play version of itself. As James frantically tried to escape out of a nearby door, where he hoped to find reality, he was met with a solid wall. I'm trapped in whatever this place is with this thing, and there's no outside reality anymore, he realized. Researcher Talaran tried to understand the entity, but SCP-3999 defied description. It was simply chaos. In his desperation, Talaran was able to dig a tiny hole in the floor through which he could see a light, filled with thoughts of his beloved family, his colleagues, and the rest of the world that had once existed. He opened the hole wider. It is unclear what happened after this, but it is apparent that James Talaran was still unable to escape SCP-3999. However, as the situations he found himself in grew increasingly strange, James Talaran was able to take greater control of his predicament. This is evidence in the Foundation's document regarding SCP-3999. Researcher Talaran cannot be contained by this. Researcher Talaran will fight his way back. Researcher Talaran will recontain SCP-3999. This torture had gone on long enough, and Researcher James Talaran was determined to be free of the creature that had taken such sick pleasure in his pain. Talaran at one point was able to subdue SCP-3999, although it is initially unclear how he accomplished this. There were several attempts made to contain the entity, using a recursive joke, a melon, the graves of American crime novelist Robert B. Parker, or an O5 council member, and a roach motel. It is believed that every single one of these attempts failed. Attempting to beat the creature at its own game, 
Talaran tried to turn SCP-3999's reality-altering powers against it by imagining the entity as something easier to subdue. These included several moldy blankets, a murderous penguin, and a pillow. Eventually, Talaran was able to contain SCP-3999 with the aid of 48 train containment personnel, all of whom were also researcher Talaran. During this time, a conversation between the two were partially recorded, although any dialogue from SCP-3999 suffered from data corruption. Claiming to finally be in charge and in control of the situation, Talaran interrogated SCP-3999, berating the creature for keeping him prisoner. You can't frighten me anymore. For the first million years of nonsensical containment procedures and tortures and dream logic, it was the worst pain I had ever felt, but I survived. For the second million years, it was still the hardest thing I had ever done, but I survived. By the third million years, I was growing numb. The researcher tried to ascertain the exact nature and origin of SCP-3999, but to no avail. Vowing to fight the entity, Talaran told it, Here's the thing about horror and weirdness. The more you reveal of it, the less effect it has. I am sick of your horror. I am sick of you. Afterwards, he was melted into goo for five years. It appears that shortly after this, researcher Talaran managed to understand how to destroy SCP-3999. While the entity was immortal and virtually unstoppable, he realized its weakness, that it had to bond to another being in order to survive. Upon discovering this, Talaran took his own life causing all that SCP-3999 had done to disappear. After Foundation researcher James Talaran committed suicide, reality reverted to its original state before SCP-3999 had heavily altered it, his death freeing reality from the evil entity once and for all. The Foundation remains unaware of what SCP-3999 was or indeed is, and one can only guess as to why the entity subjugated Talaran to such terror and horror. What made this powerful reality bender hold such a perverse fixation on one man? Some have likened the creature to a horror writer, continually subjugating a character to all manner of nightmares before deciding to redraft and try something new. Whatever it was, SCP-3999 carries with it a warning that reality isn't always as it seems. It's a perfect day for a wedding. On a warm spring afternoon, a bride and a handsome groom are exchanging the special rings they had custom designed and made for each other. As they take turns placing the rings on each other's fingers, a man standing at the end of the wedding party steps out of position. He approaches the groomsman next to him and reaches into his jacket, taking out a pair of pliers that he hands to the groomsman. The groomsman happily takes the tool and then, without any hesitation, shoves the pliers into his mouth and begins removing his teeth one by one. When he is finished, he hands the bloody teeth to the man along with the pliers. The man then goes to the next groomsman, who repeats the same process. He continues going down the line until all of the groomsmen and bridesmaids have removed their teeth, seemingly without pain or resistance. The man then approaches the bride and groom. He hands each of them half of the pile of teeth, which they gladly accept. They then begin to eat the teeth without delay, seemingly not bothered by the intense damage they're causing to their own teeth and jaws by doing so. The man watches as the groom moves the priest who is officiating the wedding aside. As the entire church looks on in joy, the groom opens his mouth and the deafening sound of cicadas are heard. This is only the beginning of what the SCP Foundation has labeled an SCP-2852 event, a terrifying and little understood phenomenon that is better known by the nickname of the anomalous creature responsible for them, Cousin Johnny. The Foundation had been trying to contain Cousin Johnny for decades, not that it had ever done them any good. Johnny is a Keter-class anomaly that's thus far proven impossible to contain. This is an entity so dangerous and volatile that three different mobile task forces are devoted to detecting and disrupting its activities. MTF Upsilon 36, aka the Party Crashers, MTF Upsilon 52, aka Cater Duty, and MTF Upsilon 99, aka the Altar Boys. 
But so far, all the Foundation has been able to really do is swoop in afterwards and do their best to pick up the pieces of people's shattered lives. Cousin Johnny has so far been observed to only operate in the North American subcontinent, and only seems to appear at Anglican or Catholic baptisms, weddings, and funerals. However, Foundation operatives charged with keeping a lid on Cousin Johnny harbor the hidden fear that he may one day expand his hunting grounds and wreak terror worldwide. If Johnny became multinational or multi-denominational, his violence, insanity, and pure evil may truly become impossible to minimize. So compatible communities are constantly monitored for increased levels of juvenile delinquency, sterility, domestic violence, and divorce. After all this, you're probably wondering, who or what actually is Cousin Johnny? And how does he cause so much horrific tragedy? At face value, nothing about the appearance of Cousin Johnny would suggest an anomalous nature, or even any sort of danger. He appears to be a middle-aged white male, often with scruffy hair and a beard. On a cellular level too, Cousin Johnny appears all too human. But when you look at his physiology, it's a whole different story. Cousin Johnny has no identifiable organs whatsoever. His body is made out of a fibrous muscular tissue. The only exceptions are his teeth and hair, which are made out of a kind of chitin, a key component of insect exoskeletons, such as those possessed by cicadas. Johnny's eyes are the first clue that something is off about him. From a distance, they appear perfectly normal, but up close, they're glassy and dead. This is because his eyes aren't actually attached to any nerves inside his head. With no nervous system or vocal cords, Johnny's ability to see, move, and talk defy any kind of logical explanation. His speech will seem completely normal to the people under his spell, but to anyone else, it comes out as complete nonsense, often described as word salad. If people in attendance are briefed in advance about this phenomenon, whatever hypnotic ability causes them to hear his sounds as intelligible words won't work and they'll be aware of how nonsensical it all sounds. But of course, that doesn't mean they're safe. Cousin Johnny appears at family gatherings and religious rituals, and immediately he'll be treated as though he's always been there. You know your Cousin Johnny, right? You go way back. Or at least you're pretty sure you do. Nothing will appear unnatural about his sudden presence. In fact, if you're one of the victims of one of his incidents, Chances are you'll actually find yourself taking a shine to Cousin Johnny. Sure, his sense of humor is a little crude and raunchy, but you can't help but enjoy his company. He's a fun guy to be around, and after all, he's family. As previously mentioned, he'll only appear at three different kinds of events, baptisms, weddings, and funerals, and only those that are affiliated with either the Catholic or Anglican religions. The SCP Foundation has classified baptisms that Cousin Johnny attends as blue-level events. Weddings are known as white-level events, and funerals are black-level events, with each one escalating in severity, violence, and horror. First, baptisms, the blue-level events. In these events, Cousin Johnny will appear and begin to act as a third godparent, despite there traditionally only being two. As the infant is lowered into the holy water, the entirety of their top layer of skin will come off like a molting snake. Despite looking horrific, this apparently causes no harm to the child. The godparents will then eat this discarded skin as though it's the most normal thing in the world. After this, the family will leave the church together, and Cousin Johnny will leave with them. He won't appear at any subsequent celebrations of the child's baptism. Of course, this is just the beginning of the terror. Following Cousin Johnny's appearance at the baptism, the child's risk of dying in the next six months skyrockets, and if they survive, they're at an increased risk of becoming unstable and violent later on in life. Their parents and godparents will both become unable to conceive any further children and are likely to be found dead from drowning within five years of the event. Those who are only tangentially involved in the baptism ritual have a massively increased chance of failed pregnancies, or if they do conceive, they may become a danger to their offspring. Children who live through blue-level events and survive past adolescence will experience adverse side effects when encountering the songs of cicadas well into adulthood, from experiencing physical sickness to going through dangerous psychotic episodes. Weddings or white-level events are more complex and severe. In this case, Cousin Johnny will insert himself into the wedding as a groomsman, and the most horrifying events will begin to take place after the vows have been exchanged. Johnny will provide various implements that allow the bridesmaids and groomsmen to remove their teeth, which are then given to the bride and groom to eat, which they do. 
causing severe damage to their own teeth in the process. The groom will then vocalize an unknown cicada call at an incredible volume, as loud as 140 decibels in some instances, rendering the bride and everyone else near the altar completely deaf. At the wedding reception, where everyone is continuing to behave as if nothing out of the ordinary is happening, Cousin Johnny will ruin things farther by giving the best man's speech. The speech is more of his typical complete nonsense, though if you're there you'll never realize this, and think that this is the best speech you've ever heard, with some in the audience laughing hysterically while others cry uncontrollably. Once his speech is done, he'll present a gift to the newly married couple. 3.5 kilograms of human hair in various colors, 13 deceased specimens of a certain cicada known as Linnae's cicada, and 23 human teeth in a cardboard box. DNA tests on all the gifts have been inconclusive as to their origin, much like many celebrity marriages. Unions that occurred during white-level events never last, and all end up divorced within two years, often as a result of domestic violence, and any children born during their brief marriage will be violent and unstable. But it's not just the wedding party that gets to experience the fun of a visit from Cousin Johnny. All married individuals who attended the wedding will find that they are unable to conceive children, despite no biological indicators of infertility. Any children present at the White Level event will show no interest in romance throughout their life, and often die tragically before reaching the age of 18. Finally, and most horrifying of all, are funerals or black level events. While blue and white level events can potentially be disrupted before they are completed, lessening or preventing the horrific results, there is as yet no way to stop or prevent a black level event at any stage. Any attempts to prevent Cousin Johnny from entering the church or funeral home will lead him to simply manifesting inside. Once in the room where the funeral is taking place, Cousin Johnny will first take up the role of eulogizer and begin speaking his standard nonsense to the attendants. The person who was emotionally closest to the departed will then open the casket, if this was not already an open casket funeral, and will then produce a large knife. It's unknown where the knives come from, as they're not present before the event and they disappear after. The funeral attendees will then use the knife on their wrists and sometimes throats, draining their blood into the coffin. Many lose more than enough blood to result in death, but none ever die from this, nor do they seem to feel any pain from their wounds. As the attendees take turns bleeding into the coffin, Cousin Johnny continues his eulogy which eventually evolves into a cicada song, the kind sung by Linnae's cicada males. The attendants sing the same song back to him in a kind of call and response. Cousin Johnny will then approach the coffin and vomit in a mixture of blood, wood pulp, and dead cicadas. The funeral will then proceed as normal, and the blood, vomit, and cicada-filled casket is then taken to the cemetery and buried. Black level events will usually end with the body being interred in the ground, but if there's a wake after the funeral, the horrors of the black level event will continue. At the wake, Cousin Johnny will climb on top of a table, lie down and encourage the other attendants to devour him, which they do. All the while he continues to talk his nonsense, until there is nothing left. Much like blue and white level events, being in attendance leads to horrific after effects. All participants who experience this event will separate from their family through either suicide, moving, or divorce. Every individual present at the event will also find that they are no longer able to produce offspring, and couples' presence may also fall victim to incidences of domestic violence, often involving cannibalism, that usually leave one or both participants dead. While six out of ten children involved will attempt to murder one or both of their parents before they turn 18. These black level events are so horrible for all involved that any members of the specialized Cousin Johnny mobile task forces that happen to witness such an event are treated with Class A amnestics before they are transferred to another task force or retire to ensure that they don't have to live with the memories of what they saw. Prior to that, they are closely monitored for any strange or antisocial behavior to make sure they weren't affected by the event. And they aren't the only SCP Foundation staff at risk of having been impacted by Cousin Johnny. It is theorized that as many as a third of Catholic and Anglican D-Class personnel were involved in the Black Level event at some point, and were driven to madness and violence by their fateful brushes with the strange relative that no one knows. So next time you're at a baptism, or a wedding or a funeral, stay vigilant, keep an eye on the other guests, and always ask yourself, do you really 
have a cousin Johnny. It was the summer of 2012 in Damascus, and for the people of Syria, it certainly seemed like all the predictions about the end of the world were coming true. The Syrian civil war was raging between multiple rebel groups, and the dictator Bashar al-Assad, whose government was shelling its own people, as well as using chemical weapons and brutal campaigns of violence across the country in hopes of quelling the rebellion. Little did they know, amidst all this pain and bloodshed, something even more dangerous was brewing. An anomalous phenomenon in the sunny plains north of Damascus that may pose a threat to all of humanity someday. A threat known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-3989, the Bone Orchard. This temporal and spatial anomaly was discovered a few years earlier in 2009, before the Syrian civil war even officially began. It's strange for a highly dangerous Keter-class anomaly to be discovered under such seemingly mundane circumstances. The SCP Foundation first became aware of SCP-3989 after a small olive orchard owner sold a strangely high amount of olives that shouldn't have been possible when compared to his reported number of Olea Europea olive trees. Field agents were dispatched to question the owner about his sudden success, but he was resistant to questioning. The agents began a covert surveillance operation to figure out what was actually going on here, at which point they discovered a considerable spatial anomaly. The olive orchard was far bigger on the inside. The property was seized by the Foundation for Containment. The owner had no real knowledge of the spatial anomaly. It's likely he just decided not to look a gift horse in the mouth while making money hand over fist from the extra olives he sold. The owner was given amnestics and a new life, as the Foundation began to study this anomaly, which was now labeled SCP-3989. To this day, no researcher has been able to figure out the origin of 3989's anomalous qualities. It was first given a Euclid-class designation and cordoned off from the public with a simple chain-link fence while Foundation investigations were underway on the inside. On a map, the plot of land the Olive Farm should occupy is about five square acres, but this plot contains an unseen portal to a pocket dimension within its 12-meter active zone, which doesn't follow the same spatial laws that our reality does. This subdimension, known as SCP-3989-A, is a hotbed of fascinating anomalous activity. Upon discovery of this hot zone, the Foundation established the nearby Area 126 as a research center and a makeshift containment facility for any anomalous entities captured from SCP-3989-A. It seemed like the Foundation really had a handle on this situation, but they were blissfully unaware of the true horrors lurking within SCP-3989-A. But they'd soon find out in the most horrifying way possible. Dr. Farah Kazeli was assigned to head the research into the anomalous zone within 3989, and naturally, he began organizing fact-finding expeditions into the heart of the affected area. The first guinea pig to head into the hot zone was former Foundation agent Hosea Herrick, who'd been demoted to the lowly D-class position of D-126-15 due to failures on a previous mission. With a remote link to Dr. Gazelli, Herrick was forced to venture into the active anomalous zone to collect footage and samples of the flora and fauna within. The first thing Herrick noticed on his expedition was the strange quality of the olive trees within the active zone. The bark was a stark white, and the leaves a bloody red. Up close, Herrick could see that the trunks and branches of the trees had undergone a process known as ossification, where the material slowly becomes bone or bone-like tissue. Hence the anomaly's creepy name, the Bone Orchard. These ossified trees became known as SCP-3989-1. Herrick also made another discovery. All over the trees and ground were worm-like creatures that looked like long maggots that the Foundation dubbed SCP-3989-1A. Agent Herrick then noticed something was off about the leaves of the ossified trees. They were beating. He looked closer and they appeared to be heart tissue filled with pumping veins. Dr. Gazelli ordered Herrick to take a branch for testing, and when he did, the tree began to bleed. When he looked down, he saw that the worm-like creatures that covered the ground were now crawling up his legs. Ignoring orders from Dr. Gazelli, Herrick fled from the active zone in terror. As he left, Dr. Gazelli caught something in the corner of Herrick's body cam footage, a long white hind limb disappearing behind a tree. Back in our normal dimension, 
tests on the sample hair it collected yielded more upsetting discoveries. Genetically, the trees were identical to humans, the trunks were human bone, and the leaves really were made of human heart tissue. Fascinated and just a little bit horrified, Dr. Gazelli authorized further expeditions into 3989-A. This time, though, Agent Herrick would be accompanied by another D-Class, and both would be armed with handguns and protective body armor. As it would turn out, this expedition would be even more horrifying than the first. As the two D-Classes explored the active zones to collect further samples, they found that the worms were responsible for the ossification of the otherwise non-anomalous olive trees. They consumed the wood little by little and deposited human bone matter in return. Herrick and his companion also noticed that these trees were beginning to bear fruit. Dr. Gazelli ordered Herrick to collect some of this fruit for testing, but when they attempted to remove the fruit, it burst, releasing more worm creatures. It seemed that the converted trees acted as incubators for their egg sacs. Before the duo could return with the samples they were able to take, the creature that had been spotted on Herrick's body cam during the first mission finally appeared. It was huge, with long white limbs, and no facial features except for a huge mouth. It grabbed Herrick's companion and literally ate the top half of his body in a single bite before dropping his legs to the ground. This horrifying beast, and the many others like it, would later be designated as SCP-3989-2A. Herrick pulled out his sidearm and shot the creature several times. The creature ignored the bullets, though, and charged Herrick. The feed from his body cam cut out soon after. Both men were declared killed in action, and in recognition of his sacrifice, Josiah Herrick was posthumously reinstated to his old position in the Foundation. Job well done, Agent. Dr. Gazelli, meanwhile, prepared for the next mission. This time knowing of the clear dangers present within the Bone Orchard, Dr. Gazelli recruited the help of MTF Zeta-9, aka the Mole Rats. Three members, referred to as Charlie Team, were sent into the anomalous zone, once again remotely directed by Dr. Gazelli. They were equipped with experimental ultrasound technology, so they could scan the fruit of the trees within 3989-A without breaking any and incurring the wrath of 3989-2A, which seemed to act as sentries for the trees. Early on in their journey, they found the body of Agent Herrick crucified against one of the ossified trees, his skin covered in mysterious symbols that were likely of Sarkic origin. While we don't have time to fully explore Sarkicism, that will require a video explanation all of its own, all you need to know is that it's a dangerous religious cult that worships flesh and disease and has close ties to similar dangerous anomalies, like SCP-610, also known as the flesh that hates. People familiar with that SCP will note eerily strange similarities to some of the things the mole rats were about to encounter. As Charlie team explored, they saw a huge number of 3989-2As observing them with eyeless faces from between the ossified trees. They pressed on, until they discovered what seemed to be an entirely new kind of tree within the bone orchard. SCP-3989-2 were huge trees made out of what appears to be enlarged human spines in place of a trunk. The smaller twigs on the tree were made from heart and lung tissue, and the whole thing was covered in what appeared to be human amniotic sacs. Charlie team attempted to use their ultrasound scanners to discover the contents of these sacs, but one of them exploded in the process, releasing an entirely new variety of monster. From the sacks emerged the larval stage of SCP-3989-2B, smaller humanoid monsters with no faces, no sensory organs, two pelvises, four legs, and an exposed spine. Suddenly, Charlie team could feel a horrifying sarcic presence around them, which one member of the team described as being like someone grabbing her liver and giggling in her face. As the various monsters of the Bone Orchard began to converge on the team, the voice of the Sarkic Prophet of War and the Hunt, Oruk, began sounding in their ears. He was beckoning them to join him. While Charlie team fled from the active zone, Dr. Gazelli felt increasingly drawn into it. He heard the voice of Oruk, and he liked what he heard. Little by little, the workers of Area 126 were losing their minds manipulated by the sarcic power of the Bone Orchard right next to them. 
day after day. They were no longer loyal to the Foundation. They wanted to serve their new Dark Masters. The fourth and final expedition was led by Dr. Gazelli himself. He took a band of loyal followers and one non-believer on a quest into the active zone to find an Orkian temple they believed was hidden in the very heart of the Bone Orchard. Once they were inside, Gazelli and his loyalists murdered the non-believer as a sacrifice to their new master. They carried on until they eventually found what they were looking for, a giant stone temple resembling an Aztec ziggurat, dubbed SCP-3989-4. There they also encountered a new kind of monster, dubbed SCP-3989-3. These beasts were larger than the others and resembled ancient warriors. They had insect-like exoskeletal armor, horned heads, additional hind and forelimbs, and integrated bladed weapons. What Dr. Gazelli and his companions thought would be paradise turned out to be a kind of hell as they were led into the temple where temporal and spatial distortions broke their mind and the multiple highly aggressive instances of SCP-3989-3, Dash 2A and Dash 2B broke their bodies. The whole thing had been a horrifying trap. In that moment, back at Area 126, another fleshy, horrifying tree sprouted out of the ground in the middle of the complex. Monsters that had once been Dr. Gazelli and his followers emerged from its amniotic sacs and all hell broke loose throughout the complex. Soon enough, the base was crawling with monsters from the Bone Orchard and staff who'd become brainwashed Sarkic cultists working in service of Oruk. Humans were gathered up to be sacrificed to the ever-growing number of anomalous trees. Things came to a head when the anomaly in Area 126 was visited by an outside agent from the Foundation working on behalf of the Hazardous Materials Containment Liaison. Biological containment specialist Dr. Marshall Grant and his team arrived at the site and were horrified to see the Sarkic nightmare that had unfolded. They quickly engaged in a firefight with the anomalous creatures and Sarkic devotees who'd gained control over Area 126. A number of Dr. Grant's team were lost in the process, but thankfully, they were able to eventually regain control of the base and the anomalous area. After this incident, SCP-3989 was upgraded to Keter class and given a huge upgrade in security, including four meter high concrete walls and a platoon sized regimen of mobile task force members with heavy weaponry. The force that took over the minds of those exposed was designated SCP-3989-5, a force so powerful that those infected are given the choice to self-terminate or be contained forever. This may seem like a somewhat happy ending to a grim tale, but one detail keeps Dr. Grant and everyone at the Foundation who is forced to deal with 3989 awake at night. According to all recent studies into the Bone Orchard, it isn't contained at all. In fact, the active zone is getting bigger. From gigantic, indestructible, self-regenerating reptiles to enormous tentacled telepathic organisms, it should come as no surprise that the SCP Foundation has gone head-to-head -head against a lot of large-scale aggressors, or LSAs, in its time. Naturally, a creature of heightened size and aggression can often prove challenging to contain, and the threat these LSAs pose is often far too big to ignore. But anyone familiar with the Foundation will tell you they're not above using any methods necessary to keep these creatures contained. Huge vats of molecular acid, impenetrable cells, disposable D-class personnel, even other SCPs. But what other SCPs could possibly be big enough and tough enough to handle some of the Foundation's biggest and baddest? Meet SCP-5514, otherwise known as the Dragon Slayer. While it might sound like something out of an anime, SCP-5514 is a massive robotic mech designed to take on the worst other SCPs can throw at it. For any who are unfamiliar with the term, a mech or mecha usually refers to an upright standing machine or automaton controlled by a human pilot. What distinguishes a mech from a vehicle is their often humanoid shape, standing bipedally and they are often hundreds of meters tall. All of this is true of SCP-5514. And in fact, given that it requires a trained member of Foundation staff to operate it, the mech itself requires very little in the way of containment. Only members of Mobile Task Force Ada-5 are trained and authorized to pilot SCP-5514. 
This is one of the SCP Foundation's specialized units, specifically designed to deal with the threat of large-scale aggressors, much like SCP-5514 itself. But SCP-5514 wasn't discovered or captured by the Foundation for use for the containment of LSAs, nor was it stolen from a foreign military or found buried under the ground. Then, where did it come from, and who built it? Working with the Global Occult Coalition and the Government of High Brazil, an anomalous island off the west coast of Ireland, the Foundation themselves constructed SCP-5514 using various anomalous methods and techniques. In 1988, a Foundation site was destroyed by an unidentified LSA, highlighting the inadequacy of the current defenses against these larger, more damage-resistant creatures. The Foundation, the Coalition, and High Brazil formed a joint operation, the Key Project, and examined SCP-2406, an automaton 93 meters tall thought to be created by ancient Mechanites. Together, the Key Project opted to create their own similar machine, viewing it as the best way to defend against further incursions with large-scale aggressors. The construction of SCP-5514 began in 1990. The intention of all parties involved in the Key Project, including the Foundation, was that the Dragon Slayer would be deployed in the event of an attack by an LSA. It would arrive at cities under attack and immediately engage large-scale aggressors in combat. Building of the mech continued at a consistent pace for eight years. However, it was the occurrence of SCP-5391 and subsequent intervention by the O5 Council that accelerated the creation of the Dragon Slayer by any means necessary. On June 30th, 1998, a number of seismic disturbances were detected, including tsunamis, tremors, and volcanic activity both underwater and above ground. What followed was the appearance of multiple large-scale aggressors, which would soon become designated as SCP-5391, the exact kind of scenario that the Dragon Slayer was being built for had already arrived, and the mech was still far from completion. While the Foundation and its allies deployed forces to drive the enormous creatures back to the ocean, Something needed to be done to bring SCP-5514 into the fight, and fast. The O5 Council authorized the use of anomalous materials in the continued construction of the Dragon Slayer, both to speed up the process and have it ready for deployment, but also to give the mech every advantage against the abundance of large-scale aggressors from SCP-5391. As a result, SCP-5514 was designed to incorporate features and technology far beyond that of any conventional military-grade weapons. The first hurdle, how do you power a machine the size of SCP-5514? Naturally, with the most gigantic nuclear furnace there is, the sun. More specifically, a perpetually stable miniaturized sun known as SCP-037. Even though it only has a diameter of two inches, this little sucker is better than premium fuel. The surface temperature of SCP-037 is around 5,000 Kelvin, generating plenty of energy to power the SCP-5514 mech. Stored in the Dragon Slayer's chest, this mini-sun is kept stable by subdimensional portals that vent excess energy off this plane of reality, stopping the mech, its pilot, and anything around it from melting. In fact, SCP-037 produces so much juice that only 1% of its energy output is enough to fully power SCP-5514. Now that's the power source sorted, but how do you solve the weight problem? Given the sheer size of SCP-5514, it would be easy for it to be cumbersome and potentially cause catastrophic collateral damage to its surrounding area. Well, the mech's weight is a problem for somewhere else. A whole other dimension, in fact. Much like the excess heat from its power source, various heavy portions of the SCP-5514 mech have their weight shunted off to a tiny pocket dimension. It was ensured during the creation of the mech that this alteration was perfectly calculated, so that SCP-5514 wouldn't lose any mass or density, so it operates as if it were only a fraction of its actual weight. Of course, being weightless makes flight a whole lot easier. Oh, did we forget to mention that? SCP-5514 can fly as well. This feature actually became a part of the mech completely by accident during the construction of SCP-5514, when an attempt to regulate the mech's internal circulation of air led to it having its own gravity field. This allowed SCP-5514 to fly, 
without the aid of any turbines or other means. While this was an unintentional mistake, no attempt has ever been made to correct for it, for fear that it could lead to SCP-5514 being grounded permanently. Naturally, going up against creatures so large that they require their own subcategory means that SCP-5514 needs an equally formidable arsenal. So let's move on to talk weaponry. Mounted on the mech's shoulder is a Beowulf Sigurd railgun, an anomalous weapon that also doesn't obey the laws of physics at all. The Beowulf Sigurd uses alternate gravity to affect the weight of its targets, causing projectiles to impact with higher velocity. Even the thickest skinned LSAs wouldn't want to be staring down the barrel end of one of those. Big guns aside, the SCP-5514 mech also wields a cold iron sword, over 65 feet long, this weapon was contributed to the Dragon Slayer by the High Brazil Royal Court, members of the collaborative key project that created the mech. Sure, a large-scale aggressor with thicker hide might take a few extra swings to draw blood, but it will feel those swings for a long time after, since any wounds inflicted by the Cold Iron Sword will not regenerate. Serving as less of an offensive weapon, the SCP-5514 mech also features a unique armament known as the Thousand Word Arrows. As pretentious as it might sound, within the mech are seven poets. Their role is to write and recite poems that detail the slaying of monsters, and these recitals are then broadcast from the Dragon Slayer. On the surface, this seems to have no practical applications during a fight with LSAs. However, the goal of the Thousand Word Arrows is a form of psychological warfare. The recital of poems telling of the mech's victory and the defeat of large-scale aggressors is intended to have the effect of demoralizing SCP-5514's adversaries while encouraging the pilot during combat. Additionally, worn atop the head of the SCP-5514 mech almost like a hat is a discus with plasma-coated edges. If the Dragon Slayer needs to deal damage at range, then it can hurl this disc and recall it immediately thanks to built-in electromagnets. In emergency scenarios, if the Cold Iron Sword is damaged or dropped and irretrievable, SCP-5514 is also equipped with an additional melee weapon. Stored in the right arm of the mech is a holdout plasma wrist blade. This superheated blade is strong enough to cut through almost anything. However, this blade is strictly to be used as a backup weapon. Finally, should all else fail, one of SCP-5514's greatest strengths can also be used as a deadly weapon. The Emergency Sun Vent allows a fraction of the excess power from SCP-037 to be released, at the risk of causing massive damage, not only to LSAs, but to any civilians or structures nearby. It is because of the destructive risk involved that this weapon is only authorized to be used as a final resort, and luckily SCP-5514 is currently undefeated. Since the arrival of multiple large-scale aggressors as a result of SCP-5391, the SCP-5514 mech has managed to successfully eliminate 12 of these LSA creatures, either by terminating or otherwise incapacitating them. Given that its completion was fast-tracked through the use of anomalous elements, SCP-5514's first combat deployments also served as field tests of the mech's operation and the various weapons and features. Arriving in Tokyo overseen by the Foundation's own Captain Rosales and Dr. Kaori, SCP-5514's first target was a creature designated LSA Wake-02, as well as several other unidentified large creatures. As the LSA was about to attack Tokyo Harbor, SCP-5514 was dispatched, its arrival heralded by the Thousand Word Arrows. Champion, champion, exalt in the glory of the Dragon Slayer, the poets recited. Surprisingly, the poetry worked, hearing it had a noticeable effect on LSA Wake-02, causing the creature to back away shrieking. With a single throw of the rounded recoiling plasma, SCP-5514 immediately beheaded Wake-02, damaging a number of the other nearby LSAs as it retrieved the disc via its electromagnets. Once again, the Thousand Word Arrows cheered on the mech and the pilot reciting, The vicious beast slain, gone to those which were once bane. After dispatching several of the minor LSAs with its cold iron sword, SCP-5514 became aware that Wake-02 was not fully down for the count. A second head had protruded from the mouth of the creatures first, issuing some sort of retreat call to the remaining LSAs in Tokyo Harbor. This second head then shot towards SCP-5514, narrowly missing its leg but allowing other LSAs to close the distance and prepare an attack. 
Luckily, the SCP-5514 mech sword cleaved the beast in two. The mech began firing on the remains of Wake-02 with its Beowulf Sigurd railgun, launching itself into the air and flying towards the target while bringing its cold iron sword down through the air. With a single motion, SCP-5514 brought the blade all the way down the LSA's body, from the creature's head to its caudal fin, gutting the large-scale aggressor and splitting its entire body in two. After one final squirm, both halves were finally still. SCP-5514 had passed its first field test. The mech functioned exactly as designed, all its various weapons and features working in tandem to defeat a creature far too large and powerful for any conventional force to handle. And thus the deed was done. Exult, exult in the glory of the Dragon Slayer. The thousand word arrows called out as the other LSAs retreated. One cannot help but feel cautiously optimistic about our chances of survival, knowing that the Foundation has SCP-5514 as the first line of defense against huge, monstrous beings that threaten humanity. As the situation with SCP-5391 continues, the SCP-5514 mech remains on the front line, standing between innocent human beings and the looming shapes of multiple large-scale aggressors. With creatures that pose such a large-scale threat, it certainly is lucky that disparate groups were able to put aside their differences and work together to build a large-scale mech. And because they did, now we have the Dragon Slayer on our side. Ranger Halter felt the bark of the tree trunk slamming into his back, practically knocking all the air out of his lungs as he tried desperately to slow his frantic breathing. The sound of his own panting filled him with a sudden, horrifying thought. If he could hear his own ragged breaths, then it could hear them too. He clamped a hand over his mouth, clenching his jaw shut so tightly that he thought his teeth might splinter as he pushed them together. His free hand gripped the tranquilizer gun, shuddering as the snap of a twig rang out somewhere behind him. It had caught up to him already. He could bolt, make a quick dash for a cover behind another tree, but it was close enough now that it would see him. And if it did, it would come rushing after him with a speed that even a seasoned park ranger couldn't match. As much as he tried to force himself to stay still, the petrified curiosity got the better of him. Holter peeked out from behind the tree and immediately wished he hadn't. It had all started out as what sounded like an everyday occurrence. High atop his watchtower in the Glacier National Park, Ranger Holter had been enjoying the view of Montana's Rocky Mountains, a cup of coffee from his thermos in his hand. Then the familiar squawk of his radio had cut short his appreciation of the serene scenery. Holter sighed, tossing the remaining contents of the cup over the tower's railing, wondering what kind of day he was in for as he went to answer the radio. Most of the time, things in Glacier Park were as peaceful as they looked but the park ranger knew that staying vigilant could make all the difference when it came to finding a missing hiker in time, or the difference between deterring a group of campers away from a family of bears and having a hell of a mess to clean up. He pushed down on the button for the microphone, connected to the bulky radio that took up practically an entire desk. Halter, thank God, came the relieved voice from the other side. We've been trying to reach everyone, put them on alert. We've got trouble. Reports of a coyote gone feral attacking folks. I'm on it, Holter replied, grabbing his gear from the cramped watchtower as he continued to speak into the mic. Where did the report come in from? Not far from your station. I'd say about a click west from your position. Stowing his tranquilizer gun, Ranger Holder descended the ladder from his watchtower down to ground level. As a park ranger, Holder valued the environment he worked in. And as a fan of the SCP universe, we know how much you value intricate world building, or in some cases, world destroying. But either way, we couldn't be happier to introduce you to the sponsor of today's video, World Anvil. World Anvil is a comprehensive set of world building tools that not only help you craft and organize your unique setting, but also present it in a captivating manner. From wiki-like articles and interactive maps to a full-fledged RPG campaign manager and novel writing software, World Anvil has everything a world creator could dream of. World Anvil equips you with over 25 templates, prompting you to dive deeper into your creations. Enrich your content by embedding maps, images, sound effects, and even little secrets for that immersive touch. With their innovative design, you can easily visualize your world through maps, chronicle its history with timelines, and fine-tune events with intricate details. Your crafted world can be beautifully showcased on a unique homepage, inviting others to dive into your vision. Got a sudden 
idea while working on another? No problem. World Anvil lets you swiftly create new articles or link existing ones, ensuring you never lose track of your inspiration. But my personal favorite feature is their interactive maps. Beyond just creating and uploading your own designs, you can directly link your creations, allowing for a dynamic and engaging experience. And if you're collaborating, invite your team to refine, write, and even let your fans chip in. I'm currently working on my own interactive map of Site 17, and maybe I'll even let you see it when I'm done. But don't wait for me. Dive into World Anvil yourself and elevate your world building game. And here's a treat use our link in the description to go to worldanvil.com and use the code SCP to grab a whopping 51% off any yearly subscription. Explore, create, and share with World Anvil. The sun was already starting to dip out of sight behind the trees. Pretty soon it'd be pitch black, save for the beam of his flashlight. He had to move fast. Coyotes were only known to attack humans on rare occasions. Usually they kept away, at least enough to make them a minimal risk. But waiting for him just west of the watchtower wasn't a coyote. At least, not at first. Watching it from behind the tree moments later, Ranger Holter's stomach turned at the sight of the creature. It walked bipedally, like a human, but the shape was all wrong. Its legs looked broken, but that hadn't stopped it from catching up. Instead of bending at the knee, they were Z-shaped, pointing back behind the creature, then twisting back again in the opposite direction at the joint. They looked more like the legs of a dog, but they were far too big. The same could be said of the arms, bent out of shape at multiple points like its legs were. The creature was a mess of misshapen limbs. The cartilage in its ears had seemingly reformed into points, and there were claws protruding from its fingertips, practically bursting out from where a human's fingernails would be. But beneath it all, and what alarmed Ranger Holter the most, was its skin. It had darkened in patches, layers of fur sprouting over those areas, but there were still parts that remained clear, where skin, human skin, was still visible peeling away to reveal the new, fur-coated layer underneath. It looked like a grotesque accident, like something ripped straight out of an old horror movie, the kind of monster that a mad scientist would make by haphazardly splicing DNA and playing God. Holter checked the tranquilizer gun in his trembling fingers, still empty after that most recent shot. He reached for another dart, slowly sliding it into the loading mechanism and readying the pistol. It cocked and made a sound. The creature's malformed head turned, snapping directly towards the source of the noise, directly towards Holter. He turned to sprint away, trying to expand the distance between him and it. If he was too close, the dart wouldn't have enough momentum when he pulled the trigger. The toe of his boot snagged on something solid, unmoving, a root from the tree he'd been hiding behind. He felt himself tumble, landing with a hard thud against the forest floor. His gun, it had fallen from his grasp. He scrabbled around in the dirt for it, barely able to see where the tranquilizer had landed in the dark. Just as his fingertips brushed past something metal, Holter felt the force of something heavy strike his back again. This time, though, it wasn't a tree. It was the creature. It snarled, gnashing its candid jaws that were protruding out of its skull, rows of sharp teeth that had uprooted the old ones burying themselves into the park ranger's neck and not letting go, until he'd stopped moving for good. A few short hours later, a convoy of mysterious unmarked vehicles arrived at Glacier National Park. The rest of the park rangers, who had reported the strange activity, were approached by shadowy figures who refused to give their names or offer up any form of identification other than just referring to themselves as experts in things like this. Not long after, none of the others would remember Ranger Holter or the incident that had led to his untimely death. After administering amnestics, it didn't take the SCP Foundation search party long to discover a lone coyote sniffing around the remains of a park ranger covered in blood. The wild animal was captured, to be brought back for testing before being re-released into the wild. Meanwhile, the Foundation scoured the rest of the area, until they came across the real culprit. Standing in a clearing a short distance from a footpath through the forest was SCP-1579. Of course, the next challenge was getting it packed up and transported to Biosite 66 without touching it. To the untrained eye, SCP-1579 looks to be fairly unassuming, even as far as anomalous objects go. It is simply an old wooden sculpture, the kind that can even be occasionally found in various wooded areas throughout the world. Its age is apparent from even one cursory glance at SCP-1579. 
the partial damage to its cedar surface speaking to the numerous years it has existed for, along with the bright green moss that covers it. Although, curiously, this moss doesn't seem to dry out and die in responses to changes in humidity, nor does it affect SCP-1579's structural integrity. As for where it came from and who made it, those are still unknown. As if the answer to what holds SCP-1579's anomalous properties, whether or not the cedar it was carved from or the moss coating the sculpture possesses some unknown properties, or if SCP-1579 was somehow imbued with these after being created. Initial testing by the SCP Foundation's researchers determined SCP-1579 to have an abnormally high resistance to the type of damage wood, and particularly cedar wood, is susceptible to. For one, it does not seem to show any signs of rotting or natural degradation. For another, it is also resistant to heat, at least to a certain extent. It doesn't burn the same way other objects constructed from cedar wood. However, this sculpture is not entirely indestructible. Pieces can be easily chipped off of the main body of SCP-1579, and these splintered fragments continue to carry the same anomalous effects as the rest of the sculpture, even when separate from it. But of course, you want to know about the creature. How does this supposedly harmless, if a little structurally abnormal cedar wood sculpture connects to whatever it was that killed Park Ranger Holter? Well, it's quite simple actually. SCP-1579 killed Holter. Not directly, you understand, but by proxy through its further anomalous properties. Still confused? Well then, how about a demonstration? Let's take a look at one of the Foundation's preferred test subjects, an expendable member of D-Class personnel, probably spending multiple life sentences working here at the SCP Foundation rather than behind the bars of a maximum security institution. Now, what would happen if you place this delightful individual in the same room as SCP-1579? Well, nothing initially. That is, until the subject touches the cedar wood surface of the sculpture, either out of curiosity or following the instructions of a Foundation researcher. That's when the real anomaly starts. The wooden sculpture will exhibit a slight but observable movement, shuddering slightly as if moved by an unseen force. This will precede the person who touched the object feeling a burning sensation, that kind of irritating, painful heat that spreads underneath the surface of the skin. The burning will always begin at the area of their body that made direct contact with SCP-1579, and touching it again at any point will trigger a reactivation of the sculpture's anomalous effects. Subjects experiencing the effects of SCP-1579 have described the feeling as being akin to a bad sunburn, that rapidly spreads across the skin from the point of contact, only to stop once it has affected a person's entire body. Following the subsidence of the burning sensation, subjects experiencing the side effects of touching SCP-1579 will notice an immediate change to their skin. Within a window of three minutes, their skin becomes thin and paper-like in its texture, before starting to peel away. Once this stage occurs, the peeling skin will reveal a new layer underneath, hence the colloquially used codename for this anomaly, Different Skin. However, this so-called Different Skin isn't merely a new layer of otherwise ordinary human skin. Instead, it will belong to another species entirely. A person coming into contact with SCP-1579 will find themselves rapidly developing new skin that shares the physical traits, as well as matching DNA, to that of a number of animal species. It should be noted that these features will continue to rapidly develop until the subject is entirely transformed and is no longer considered to qualify as a human being. As for the specific transformation that occurs, there are a number of known outcomes that repeat in the following cycle. Let's say our D-Class, we'll call them Subject A, touched SCP-1579 at the start of the cycle. They would, after the burning sensation stops and peeling begins, start to sprout dark feathers across their torso, arms, and upper legs, likely with a great deal of pain as the sharp quill of these feathers start to burst out from beneath the skin. Beneath the knees, Subject A will see their legs start to become yellow and scaly, as well as a change that causes their toenails to simply start to painfully protrude outwards until they form pointed, blackened talons. Subject A's face will also start to grow feathers, However, these grow outwards away from the areas of the nose and mouth. Flight feathers will also protrude from the forearms, 
multiplying in number until their entire body is covered, at which point Subject A, on every level including genetically, more closely resembles a Corvus Corax, more commonly known as the common raven, than a human being anymore. Take another test subject, Subject B, and get them to touch SCP-1579 right after. Their different skin is covered in brown fur that's approximately four inches long, their lips and skin underneath the fur will darken, and their nose will become constantly moist. Claws will start to grow from their fingertips, although these will be notably smaller than those of a fully grown creature of the same species, an Ursus arctos horribilis, or a grizzly bear. Then we get to the point in the cycle where some unwitting hiker encountered SCP-1579 in the forests of Glacier National Park, Montana. When this subject, Subject C, touched the cedar sculpture, their skin began to grow layered fur, as the cartilage of their ears is separated from their tissue and replaced by new, reshaped cartilage. Much like Subject B, who SCP-1579 turned into a grizzly bear, Subject C also had darkened skin, a moistened nose, and longer, sharper nails. It was at some point during this transformation that an unassuming park ranger stumbled upon Subject C. Frightened by what he saw, this ranger was unable to identify that what he interpreted as attacks by some kind of half-human, half-animal hybrid were actually desperate pleas for help as Subject C was transformed into a coyote. Although it's hard to say which physiological change triggered by SCP-1579 is the most alarming or unpleasant to experience, the fourth kind is in no way any more pleasant than the preceding three in the cycle. Subject D of this particular series of tests will find the new layer of skin that emerges under the old to be hairless and of a green coloration, often with brown markings. Unlike the previous instances, their skin will rapidly begin to dry out and seems to be far more reactive to the humidity of the surrounding environment. It is also far thinner than that of the skin possessed by other transformations that SCP-1579 causes. So thin, in fact, that the eyeballs of Subject D will be visible through its eyelids, which rapidly become translucent, similar to those of the Pseudacris regula, otherwise known as the Pacific Tree Frog. Repeated activation of SCP-1579's anomalous properties will trigger the next transformation in the cycle, whether the cedarwood sculpture is touched by a new subject or repeatedly by the same person. In the latter instance, where a subject is re-exposed to SCP-1579, the additional changes their body undergoes will be significantly more painful. Their already newly replaced outer layer of skin will fail to dry out and will begin bleeding instead. Three or four consecutive exposures to SCP-1579 will lead to excessive bodily trauma for the subject, usually causing them to die from shock before the fourth transformation is complete. And as we're sure you can imagine, an amalgamation of a human, a raven, a grizzly bear, a coyote, and a tree frog is hardly a pleasant sight. This unfortunate fate was suffered during one of the first incidents with SCP-1579 that brought the Foundation's attention to it. During an elementary school field trip, a teacher who was explaining the history of totem poles in Native American culture accidentally touched SCP-1579. While experiencing the pain of her transformation, she fell against the sculpture in a panic, not realizing it had been what caused her to change. This repeated triggering of the object's anomalous effects led to her untimely death, an event that had to be wiped from the minds of her students by the Foundation using the careful application of Class B amnestics. For now, SCP-1579 is kept in a secure, sterile environment at a Foundation storage warehouse, where personnel are not permitted to make any contact with it, so there's no need to worry about accidentally running into SCP-1579 in the wild. Although, there are always plenty of other things to worry about while out on a hike through the forest. Things that could be right behind you. A giant, monstrous, crab-like claw closes around the throat of an unimaginably huge, eel-like beast. The beast's terrible, writhing tentacles wrap around and latch onto the immense crustacean, and then the high-intensity beams of gamma radiation start flying. All the while, legions of skinless centaurs swim in the waters around them, relishing the violence. And in the middle, a lone boat, the SCPS Mither, manned by a team of mobile task force operatives that does all it can just to survive. There are those who consider outer space to be the ultimate achievement in exploration, the one place that explorers have yet to chart and understand. 
However, some of the murkiest mysteries in the universe are on our own planet, deep down at the bottom of the ocean. 95% of the deep ocean remains completely unexplored, and the little glimpses we have gotten paint a picture of something truly alien. Giant squids, organisms that can breathe nitrogen, luminescent predatory fish, and sharks as old as the Earth itself. Even the SCP Foundation is still struggling to fully grasp the depth of the ocean and the strange beings that dwell there. One of the most unusual aquatic findings in the history of the Foundation is that of SCP-3700. SCP-3700 refers to a circular area in the North Sea with a diameter of 800 kilometers. The waters there are abnormally deep for the region, with the seafloor resting at 5 kilometers beneath the ocean's surface. There are two entities present in the waters of SCP-3700, designated SCP-3700-1 and SCP-3700-2. Interactions between these two entities are responsible for the anomalous changes to the meteorological and geological conditions in the area. SCP-3700-1 and SCP-3700-2 always interact on the spring and fall equinoxes of any given year, but they will also engage one another throughout the year, seemingly at random. But what exactly are SCP-3700-1 and SCP-3700-2? Aside from terrifying creatures of the deep, SCP-3700-1 is an arthropod bearing an aesthetic resemblance to the European lobster, only much, much bigger, measuring 6 kilometers in length. The creature is green, with a mix of blue, yellow, pink, and red markings across the top of its exoskeleton that bear the appearance of a woman's face. It has six prehensile limbs, four of which terminate in claws and eight legs. The entity's four eyes are compound and orange, attached to stalks. Anyone who gets close enough to observe the creature's carapace in detail will notice scars, cracks, and small holes indicating years and years of damage. SCP-3700-1 has several anomalous qualities in addition to its size. In a fight, it is able to strike with its appendages and produce cavitation bubbles with a force greater than several tons of dynamite. Two of the entity's eyes are capable of blasting concentrated gamma radiation at a chosen target. The creature has the ability to impact the weather around it, dispersing storms that impede its ability to move with ease, and can reach speeds up to 100 kilometers an hour. In spite of its immense power, SCP-3700-1 is not aggressive and tends to ignore beings in its vicinity other than SCP-3700-2. Speaking of SCP-3700-2, it is a 32-kilometer long entity, resembling a pelican eel in all aspects except for its massive size and the 13 appendages that encircle the middle section of its body. These appendages, which tuck inside its body when not in use, are similar to the tentacles of an octopus, complete with suckers. The majority of the entity's body consists of a sinewy tail, terminating in a sharp point. When its mouth is open, it is an estimated 3 kilometers deep. Its flesh is black, and it has white, purple, and red bioluminescent lines in the shape of a man's face on either side of its torso. SCP-3700-2's anomalous properties include the ability to invoke storms with the severity of Category 5 hurricanes, and the ability to produce whirlpools that draw in any vessel within 150 meters so that it can rip them apart. It is also able to produce high-energy sound waves, as well as blue fire, which it emits from its esophagus. When the two entities interact, it results in an epic struggle as each begins attempts to destroy or subdue the other. When one is victorious, immediate changes to the area follow. When SCP-3700-1 wins, the storms and harsh weather in the area will immediately calm, and an era of fertility and abundance will begin. The reproductive rates of fauna in the ocean and on the islands nearby increase threefold, and the crop yield doubles. The ocean itself becomes increasingly active, and the erosion rates of the archipelago's shores increase fivefold. When SCP-3700-2 wins, however, 
the weather conditions become dangerous. With raging hurricanes, rapidly fluctuating temperatures, and constantly changing storm fronts that cause destruction of buildings and loss of life. Naturally, this renders any ocean travel in the area extremely difficult or even impossible. Aquatic food sources are driven away by harsh conditions, and livestock are killed by exposure and disease. Crops are unable to thrive in the high winds, waterlogged soil, and lack of sunlight. All the while, SCP-3700-2 swims throughout the area, preying on unsuspecting ships and menacing the coastline until SCP-3700-1 manifests to challenge it again. SCP-3700-2 will also regurgitate instances of SCP-3456, though how or why this is possible is unknown. For those unfamiliar with SCP-3456, they are a group of hairless, three-toed, horse-like creatures with thick, translucent skin and human torsos fused to their backs. They are most frequently seen near sites of war, terrorist attacks, and devastating natural disasters. Direct observation of one of these entities will draw their attention to the observer, who the entity will then stalk and capture before disappearing. Due to their enormous size and ability to anomalously manifest in their home waters, SCP-3700-1 and 2 cannot be contained at a Foundation site. Instead, their containment is handled by Foundation Naval Task Force Delta-7, Northern Storm, who patrol the area in combination of refurbished battleships, destroyers, cruisers, and support craft. Additionally, measures have been taken to suppress information about SCP-3700 among the general population. Details about the unusual depth of the waters there have been stricken from public texts and scientific publications. SCP-3700-1 has been implanted with Donovian hollow projectors, which disguise it as a pod of humpback whales. If SCP-3700-1 encounters SCP-3700-2, Delta-7 may engage protocol Winter Maelstrom. This consists of destroyers deploying harpoon-based anchors into SCP-3700-2's head to hold it in one location. Next, the vessels work together to target the entity until SCP-3700-1 is able to subdue it. If this does not prove effective and SCP-3700-2 cannot be contained, then the task force will implement Protocol Tumult. At this point, naval and civilian crafts in the area must be evacuated. Trade and ferry routes to the archipelagos must be rerouted for at least six months. There will be constant aerial and naval engagement with SCP-3700-2, and constant monitoring for the reappearance of SCP-3700-1. The behavior of SCP-3700-1 and SCP-3700-2 is largely very predictable, with one notable exception. On March 20th, 2017, a pair of SCP Foundation-owned battleships known as the Mither and the Terran arrived at a point between the Orkney, Shetland, and Faroe Archipelagos in the North Sea. They were accompanied by the usual fleet of Delta-7 ships. Approximately 600 meters away from the ship's anchor points, the water began to emit intense bright rays of light for a duration of three minutes. At this point, SCP-3700-1 appeared, visible through the surface of the water. Delta-7 withdrew their anchors, speeding toward the entity. As the ships caught up to the entity, it raised two of its claws into the air, clicking them together in a friendly greeting. The Delta-7 ships followed the entity along its usual swimming path for 30 minutes, and during this time, all was peaceful. But this peace did not endure for long. The tide began to change, literally. As large black wall clouds formed overhead, the winds picked up, and the waves churned violently. In response, SCP-3700-1 raised its claws overhead, waving them in a circular motion, and parting the clouds above it and Delta-7. But this effort took a lot out of the creature, and after 30 seconds, its antenna began to droop, and it lowered its claws. Still, the hole in the clouds remained, allowing a spot of sunshine to break through and beam down on the Foundation vessels. 600 meters ahead, 
the ocean waters began to rage and froth, spraying foam and surf into the air. SCP-3700-2 burst from beneath the surface, its head pointed upward. It continued to rise until the tops of its tentacles could be seen just above the water, then stopped to bend its torso and turn its head horizontally, its jaw unhinged, exposing rows upon rows of serrated teeth. The beast let out a mighty roar, accompanied by a stream of blue flame. At the sight of its rival, SCP-3700-1 dove beneath the surface, disappearing from view. The SCPS Mither ordered the rest of the vessels to engage Protocol Winter Maelstrom. Delta-7 scattered out from SCP-3700-1's point of submersion, and all 13 destroyers fired their harpoons at SCP-3700-2, embedding themselves in the entity's head. Naturally, this enraged the creature, and it began to roar and wail spinning its lower body vigorously enough to generate a whirlpool. The cruisers opened fire with a combination of L cannons and conventional weaponry in order to distract the entity as the destroyers pulled their harpoon lines taut, dragging its head in a continuous circle. While this was taking place, the battleships got into position and prepared to fire on the Mither's mark. Three, two, one, fire! The first broadside barrage collided with SCP-3700-2, and it grunted in pain, thrashing back and forth before opening its mouth and spewing an instance of SCP-3456 into the water. As soon as it hit the water, the equine monster began to cut through at a pace of 50 kilometers an hour, making its way toward the destroyers, particularly the SCPS Selkie. The Selkie attempted to retarget its weapons and prevent the creature from reaching it but the monster moved too quickly for the Selkie to adjust. The Selkie was lifted out of the water by the creature as crew members desperately clung to the railings and their weaponry. As the crew cowered and tried to fend off the creature, it reached for them, trying to pull them from the ship. While the Selkie was occupied, SCP-3700-2 was able to attack again, blasting another ship with a stream of blue fire. A loud crack rang out from across the sea as the Selkie dropped back into the water the SCP-3456 instance shrieking in pain. SCP-3700-1 burst through the surface, striking the creature with its club-like limbs, each blow emitting another loud crack. The third blow tore the instance in half, sending its human torso careening through the air and past the SCPS Mither. Freed from its attack, the Selkie moved full steam ahead, pulling the harpoon line taut again and dragging SCP-3700-2 out of its path. Several Silky crew members were thrown overboard during the struggle, and as they struggled to keep their heads above water, SCP-3700-1 scooped them up, placing them onto the deck of a nearby destroyer and out of harm's way. With the crew members rescued, SCP-3700-1 set its sights on its enemy, swimming towards the edge of the whirlpool and emitting a luminescent glow from two of its eyes. The constant barrage of cannon fire on SCP-3700-2 was beginning to take its toll, and the Mither ordered the fleet to, quote, brace for the killing blow. As if responding to the Mither's call, SCP-3700-1 shot several concentrated blasts of gamma radiation at its foe leaving large holes in the creature in their wake. SCP-3700-2 screamed, flailing so hard that it snapped the harpoon lines and created waves large enough to push the vessels backward. With its newfound freedom, SCP-3700-2 impaled SCP-3700-1 through the midsection with its barbed tip of its tail lifting it up and out of the water with the force of the blow. SCP-3700-1 desperately tried to free itself, attacking the tail with its club-like limbs, but the fight was in vain, and after a moment, all movement stopped. SCP-3700-1 was, for at least the duration of this manifestation, dead. SCP-3700-2 tossed the corpse into the water, flinging it past Delta-7 where it crashed into the water and sank down into the depths below. At this point, Delta-7 was ordered to initiate Protocol Tumult. The Delta-7 vessels turned away from SCP-3700-2 and prepared to evacuate the area. One of the ships, the SCP-S Strosony Beast, slowed behind the rest of the fleet, emitting concerning amounts of smoke before coming to a stop. 
Meanwhile, the enraged and emboldened SCP-3700-2 expanded the size of its whirlpool, setting its sights on the retreating ships and the weakened Strawsony Beast. The ship tried to flee, but the engines were completely shot and would not respond. The ship was caught in the whirlpool and pulled against its will toward SCP-3700-2. As the crew looked on in helpless dread, a tentacle rose from the deep, wrapping around the vessel and dragging it toward the entity's gaping maw. Suddenly, SCP-3700-1 exploded from beneath the surface of the water, leaping between the ship and SCP-3700-2, cutting the tentacle in half and freeing the Strosny Beast from its grip. SCP-3700-2 shrieked before closing its jaws and biting down on SCP-3700-1. It retaliated, emitting bright flashes of light and doing enough damage to stop SCP-3700-2 from continuing to produce its whirlpool. Another tentacle emerged from the water, pulling at SCP-3700-1's legs and ripping them from its body. But SCP-3700-1 returned the assault in kind, bludgeoning SCP-3700-2 with its club-like limbs from inside of its mouth. All at once, SCP-3700-2's lower jaw was torn out of place, dropping into the water with SCP-3700-1 still inside. SCP-3700-2 thrashed futilely, growing steadily weaker and weaker. It released one more stream of fire before collapsing. Delta-7 paused the retreat, watching the scene for any sign of a winner, but after five minutes, neither entity had moved. Delta-7 returned to the site of the battle to investigate and saw that neither entity was moving, and both appeared to be deceased. Shortly after Delta-7 reached the area, both entities disappeared, leaving a single, round, unidentified object that sank below the surface where SCP-3700-1 had just been. The wall clouds overhead dispersed, leaving standard cumulonimbus clouds in their place. The waters themselves remained choppy. Unsure of how to proceed, the SEPS Mither sent a radio transmission to command. Ah, uh, this is Delta-7 to command. We read you, Delta-7, command replied. We have a bit of a situation. Go ahead, Delta-7. SCP-3700-1 and 2 are both down. Command was silent for 10 seconds, utterly baffled by the information. Please repeat, Delta-7. Again, the Mither said, SCP-3700-1 and 2 are both down. Command ordered the Mither to stand by. Three minutes of radio silence later, communication resumed as they asked, Are either entity's effects active? Ah, uh, negative, Command. Is there any trace of either entity? Also negative. It appears the anomaly has been neutralized. Delta-7 is to return to base for debrief following any recovery efforts. With their next steps clear, Delta-7 attached the Strosny Vs to several tugboats, preparing to pull the vessel to safety. But there was one more surprise waiting. The SCPS Mither began picking up unusual levels of gamma radiation, as well as a sonar contact at a depth of 3 kilometers. They called command, requesting permission to deploy submersibles for exploration purposes. One minute of silence followed, as the command arrived at a decision. Request denied. Return to base for debriefing. And so, Delta-7 began to evacuate the area once more, steaming in the opposite direction of the battle. Over the next five minutes, CCTV cameras on the vessels picked up an unusual sight. As the gamma radiation levels continued to increase, the ocean turbulence also worsened, tossing smaller vessels and nearly causing them to capsize. Then, all of a sudden, the water stilled, and four large yellow orbs appeared below the surface, approximately 300 meters from Delta-7. They lingered there for two minutes before vanishing. Afterward, a new sonar contact was detected, five kilometers deep, directly beneath the task force. Command, we've lost the signal from the previous contact and are no longer detecting gamma radiation. Uh, we're, we're detecting new contact five kilometers deep, large and metallic. After further deliberation, command responded. Delta-7, you are authorized to deploy submersibles for exploration purposes. Be advised, should SCP-3700-2 manifest, exploration teams are to be considered lost, and you are to return to base. The consequences of this incident, as well as what else might be lurking down in the depths beneath SCP-3700, are still unknown. Maria Delgado tumbled through the air. The furious sea wind whipped all around her. Her hair blew in her eyes, 
trying to shield them from the view of what was rapidly coming to hit her square in the face, an ocean as black as the night sky. She barely had a second to brace herself before, splash. The impact and the cold knocked all the air out of her. A flurry of bubbles disappeared into the darkness as she sank further and further down, not knowing which way was up. Maria kicked frantically as her waterlogged clothes dragged her back. Her head found the surface, and she barely had a moment to gasp in half a lung full of air before a wave hit her in the side of the head, knocking her back under. Kicking and spluttering, she managed to poke her head up again and tried to wave desperately at the metal behemoth looming over her. The cruise ship that had felt so safe and warm now looked like a cliff face. The lowest window that she could see was more than 100 feet above her head. There had been music playing on the deck, but she was so far below now that she couldn't even hear it anymore. All she could hear was the rumbling of the engines and an ominous swooshing, chopping sound behind her. Maria's stomach dropped. She felt the ocean pulling at her, a current forcing her beneath the waves. She had fallen off the back of the cruise ship, and that meant the current gripping her and turning her beneath the water. She tumbled and twisted in the darkness, feeling all of the air rushing out of her lungs again. Squinting as best as she could through the stinging salt water, she saw the thing that she'd been dreading, an enormous propeller, each blade the size of her house, spinning and spinning just on the edge of her vision and gliding steadily towards her. The water was sucking her towards it, pulling her faster and faster. She'd never been a very strong swimmer, but there wasn't time to feel bad about that now. She needed to escape any way she could. Desperately lashing at the water, Maria kicked and clawed herself out of the current. She had to swim sideways as fast as she could, otherwise she didn't want to think about it. The propellers were getting closer, getting larger in the water. The awful sound of their approach didn't just shake the water around her. It shook all of the water inside of her, making her stomach turn in fear. She hadn't breathed in in a long time. Her body was going into shock from the cold. Everything around her was doing its best to drag her down to a slow, icy death, or maybe a fast, painful death from the impact of several tons of spinning steel. Something hard and fast crunched into Maria's heel, moving so quickly that it sent her spinning through the water. The propeller had hit her. Its next revolution passed about a foot in front of her face before the turbulence of the cruise ship's wake took hold of her and threw her away. Then, all of a sudden, fresh air was hitting her face. The water had lifted her up to the surface and carried her in the foamy wake that stretched away from the cruise ship. Already, the metal juggernaut was a couple of hundred feet away from her. If she tried to swim after it, the currents in the water would only carry her further backward. Maria had no choice but to tread water and stare as the cruise ship that had once been so large and imposing above her steadily became a dot on the horizon and then disappeared entirely. Her husband had been in bed. She had just stepped out onto the deck to have some fresh air. He could sleep through anything. Chances are he wouldn't notice she was missing until he woke up in the morning, and who knew what time that would be. They were on vacation, and he hadn't set an alarm. He would probably assume that she'd gone for an early breakfast without him. Only once he'd sat down and finished his breakfast and gone back to the room to find she was still missing would he start to worry. By that point, she would have stopped kicking hours ago. She wasn't sure how deep the ocean was out here. How many minutes would it take for her body to sink to the bottom? Or would it take hours? Perhaps her corpse wouldn't even be halfway down to the seabed by that point. She was shivering so violently that she was struggling to keep herself above the surface. Her legs weren't kicking like they would in a pool. They were spasming and tensing up. Her clothes ballooned all around her, doing nothing but get in the way as she tried desperately to stay alive. She had no phone. It had fallen off the deck with her, now likely on its own way down to the seafloor. She had no light, not enough air in her lungs to cry for help, and no one between herself and the horizon to hear. This was it. This was how she would die. A sense of morbid curiosity filled her. What exactly was below her? Maybe there was a reef somewhere down where her corpse could lie peacefully. What she saw when she stuck her head beneath the surface was darkness, swirling and empty, and painfully cold. Except, there was something else moving down there. It looked small, smaller than she was, some kind of sea creature swimming up to meet her. 
Maria lifted her head, took a deep breath, and swam down towards it. It wasn't swimming like a usual fish. Its shadowy silhouette seemed to ripple and twist. As her eyes slowly adjusted to the darkness, she saw what it was. A squid, maybe a meter in length. At least she wouldn't be dying alone out here. The squid started to swim faster, approaching her quickly. At that moment, she suddenly remembered some of the things she'd heard about squids. Weren't they hunters? She had seen a nature documentary once where sperm whales had come up from the seabed with enormous gouges around their eyes from where they'd been attacked by a school of squids. Suddenly, Maria didn't want her companion anymore, but it was too late. The squid had almost reached her end. She felt her mind starting to float out of itself. Her eyes weren't focusing properly. The squid wasn't just swimming towards her, it was flashing, almost like a strobe light. Different lurid colors filled the ocean around her, and it convulsed in different colors until all of a sudden, it wasn't a small squid at all anymore. It ballooned in size, swelling and bulging all around her. Enormous tentacles unfurled themselves and whipped at the water all around her. It was 10 meters tall now, 20, 40, 70. The squid seemed to fill the whole ocean, swallowing up all of the available water and leaving her in a tiny puddle floating just a few feet away from its gnashing beak. Some of the tentacles didn't even look like tentacles anymore. They had turned into pinchers or even human-looking arms and legs, except the fingers were tipped with grotesque talons. She had to escape, had to get away. If Maria had thought she'd swum fast to get away from the cruise ship's propellers, it was nothing compared to how fast she swam now. Without care for her trembling limbs, struggling lungs, or rapidly fading consciousness, Maria knew she had to get away from this monstrosity. There was no hope for her without escape. The flashing lights felt like they were all around her. No matter which way she swam, it just felt like they were getting brighter and brighter until a pair of hands grabbed her and lifted her out of the water. Maria kicked and screamed, trying to fight the tentacles off, but they pinned her down to the deck and held her there. Voices surrounded her, bright lights shining in her face. This was how she would die. Until a shadow blocked out one of the lights, and her eyes managed to focus on something. It was a man. He was talking to her in another language, desperately trying to calm her down. Where was the squid? What had happened to it? Maria lashed out with her limbs, trying to shake herself free from the fishermen who were holding her down on the deck. She threw her gaze sideways and saw an enormous net lifting a school of fish out of the water. There were hundreds of them, all thrashing and slapping against one another. And there, poking out of the bottom of the net, was a single tentacle. Dread filled her stomach, but her body gave out on her, and she fell unconscious. All right, we run it one more time. Dr. Matthews sat at the laptop and watched the grainy CCTV footage for what felt like the hundredth time. It was footage from a fishing vessel captured off the coast of Senegal. The first 30 seconds of the clip just showed the view from the front of the boat, waves splashing here and there, but mostly darkness. Then, all of a sudden, there were two shapes moving through the water. One was a terrified woman desperately swimming towards the surface. The other shape was harder to pin down. When Matthews had first watched the video, she'd seen a colossal sea creature writhing beneath the surface. But each time that she'd watched it since, the creature seemed to get a bit smaller and lose some of its sting. Perhaps the shock of what she was seeing had just been wearing off. Regardless, it was time to do the mandatory checks before the latest SCP was brought into the facility. Dr. Matthews walked through the corridors of the containment facility and came to the large double doors that led into the main hangar. It had been hard to find a facility large enough to contain this SCP. They knew it was capable of reaching enormous sizes, so they had to construct an aquarium big enough to house it at its maximum size. Dr. Matthews started walking across the walkway. It hung suspended over the reinforced aquarium and would be strictly off-limits once the SCP had been moved into the facility. It was far too easy for the squid to simply grab a member of staff and pull them beneath the water. She was heading towards the control panel at the other side. The tank was 150 meters cubed, and so walking the length of it took her well over a minute. This was by far the biggest containment she'd ever been involved with in terms of scale, as well as severity. The logistics in trying to organize the containment of this squid had run into the millions of dollars, and were still going up every day. It had taken her and her research team a while to convince the board that this SCP posed a significant enough threat to warrant the investment. She needed to make sure not to screw it up. 
Guards stood all around the perimeter of the tank, holding B-74H harpoon guns with electrified discharge shafts. Looking down into the water, Dr. Matthews could see the 15 depth charges, all hanging at various heights throughout the tank. Each of these depth charges were wirelessly connected to a computer that monitored the integrity of the glass all around the tank. If the SCP were to make even the slightest crack in the glass, all 15 depth charges were to be set off simultaneously. She hoped that was enough to kill it. God help her if it wasn't. It would keep one entity here for study, but she had reason to believe that there were more of them all over the world. And so, preparations were in place to arm a team that could scour the oceans and eliminate any others that were found. Today was the day. SCP-252, the humbled squid, was about to arrive. The shipping container was lifted by a crane and carried to the right spot. Somewhere inside it was a large sealed tank of water holding an instance of SCP-252. They would drop the shipping container into the reinforced aquarium and let it sink all the way to the bottom, before detonating remote charges on its doors and on the sealed tank inside, allowing SCP-252 to escape and fill its new enclosure. Dr. Matthews stood with her hand shaking over the button. It was now or never. Taking a deep breath, she pressed it down firmly and watched on the security camera monitor as several puffs of bubbles rose from the container and the doors swung open. None of them could see inside the container. They just had to wait. Then, all of a sudden, a small shape darted out. It was tiny, no more than a meter in length. What had happened to the reports that this thing was 75 meters across? Dr. Matthews looked around at her co-workers in shock. She didn't expect to see a monster to unfurl itself out of the container and grow larger and larger, but all that had emerged was a tiny little black squid. But none of her colleagues looked back at her. All of them were staring wide-eyed at the security feed. Matthews glanced back and saw that the little squid was flashing various colors as it swam around, just like the CCTV footage that she had been studying for the prior few weeks. A scream filled the room and was quickly answered with another as her fellow researchers ran away from what they were seeing, terrified by the shapes on the screen. Matthews just looked back and forth in confusion. The colossal sea monster that had been reported to her wasn't there. There was just a tiny squid flashing various colors. What were all of them so afraid of? And how would she break it to her boss that she'd spent millions of dollars on a giant aquarium loaded with depth charges for a squid the size of a large dog? Two weeks later, she found herself attempting to do just that. Standing in front of the disciplinary panel, Dr. Matthews tried to explain what had happened. SCP-252, the humbled squid, is suspected to be the origin of a lot of myths surrounding giant squids and perhaps even the kraken itself. When hunting, all of the squid's prey attempts to flee by the most direct path possible overcome with terror at what they are seeing. The squid can appear to be anywhere between 50 and 75 meters in size, with up to 200 appendages growing from its mantle. These appendages can all take various forms, often depending on what the prey is most afraid of. For example, a test subject who is terrified of spiders will see the hairy legs of a tarantula amongst the tentacles. But C is the important word here, because while SCP-252 appears to take on its form, the reality is that these are all hallucinations brought on by viewing the squid's rapidly flashing colors. While hunting, SCP-252 rapidly cycles its chromatophores, which results in powerful hallucinations. All prey will then immediately lay down their defenses and try to flee as quickly as possible, leaving them open to being eaten by the relatively small and weak real squid. However, as Dr. Matthews had discovered, it was possible to inoculate yourself against these effects by viewing the grainy CCTV footage from the fishing boat on repeat so many times in the run-up to SCP-252's arrival. Dr. Matthews had built up a kind of immunity, allowing her to see the SCP as it actually was, even though her colleagues ran away in terror. One fun fact, Dr. Matthews said, is that the prey will attempt to rationalize the SCP's size, even when it is in a confined space that's impossibly small. So, if you were taking a bath with the squid, you would somehow believe that the squid was both 75 meters large and fully submerged in the tub in your guest bathroom. Funny, isn't it? None of the disciplinary board members had a word. They all stared at her in bemused silence. Please don't fire me. Now go check out SCP-354 The Red Pool and a sea snail's fantasy SCP-1867 A Gentleman for more.